Powell delivered this very clear message that the Fed is going to do what it takes to get inflation down, even if that means pain for businesses and households. We think it's good that the Fed is doing what it's doing. It's on the case. It's going after inflation. If we really get weakness, if we get jobs going down, they will have to backtrack. We certainly haven't seen the earnings collapse that many of the bears have predicted. So right now, increased volatility. It will be a September to remember, but I think we will get through this okay. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. And breathe. Live from New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. For all the breathless commentary of the last couple of days, TK, about up eight-tenths of one percent. Call it nine-tenths of one percent yeah. higher on ESP this morning. Do you feel thought out from Jackson Hole last night Just about, about ATM was about like my body got back to normal? You know who's happy, Tom? Yeah. Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed, yeah, to Tracy Alloway and Joe Weisenthal yeah. on the Odd Lots podcast. He was happy to see the market reaction to Jackson Hole. Yeah. He certainly was not excited to oh, see the stock market I, rallying I, after their last federal so, open market committee I'm meeting. I'm going to so keep my mouth shut on that. Let me move on here, John, to what it is. It's August, and that's okay. Today is one of the oddest market days I've seen in ages. And, John, we have a day with these great guests to actually pause and reset for September 8th. I tell you who's got something to say about Neil Kashkari. It's Bramo. Lisa, 100%. what do you make of that? Well, he basically is saying out loud what everybody else is thinking. I mean, this is what we've been talking about again and again, that basically Fed officials probably looked at the Bloomberg terminal after that Fed chair Jay Powell's speech uh, a month or so ago and said, uh-oh, this isn't good. This is not what we want to see. And then it seemed like markets got the message, and it seemed like Jay Powell was trying to make things brief and direct enough so there was no other <clears> way <throat> to go. So if he was just say, stating the obvious. The it's quiet sort of, bit. Yeah. The quiet bit exactly. out loud. Exactly. And it's, so it's nice for them to finally say it. Yeah. Credit Suisse just jumped on all, all of this. They've gone global equities, slashing their call on global equities. And really? So they say yeah. this, yeah. clearly out of the window, the Fed pivot goes. I wish we had Jonathan Gallup on today because he has been one of the well, base bulls. And how much is this uh, just a global team, story? Different it's team. a different team, right? But how much is this a global call versus a U.S. call? And I, I got to be honest, right. when I was reading this, I was wondering how much is this because of what's happening in Europe, because of what's happening in China, versus a global feeling of concern about yeah, inflation I, I, and the necessary response. Lisa, I think you're really right there. We did have his colleague Patrick Palfrey on in my 9 o'clock property yesterday, and he maintained a real sense of optimism here that earnings uh, would, would, uh, would, would be good. John, off of the Alloway Weisenthal stream, I put in a tweet there where, and I think it's really important, Alan Greenspan really believed in the stock market. He had an immense respect for the confidence building of stocks. And I would really emphasize, if you look at the VIX, John, imagine where the VIX was in June at the bottom. It was, you know, whatever it was, 30-something, whatever. It was way out there, 34.02. We come in to the glory of 19.53. John, we're sort of midway today, John. I mean, I, I you know... It's ambivalent. I felt like you're having a conversation with yourself. No, I just I'm think... I'm looking at these banners and just trying to work them out. What, what are those numbers, Tom? Those are the VIX numbers. It's a quick way that the pros look at the market. They don't look okay. at the Dow. They don't look at SBX. They certainly don't look they at the Dow. They just follow... Yeah, they, they follow VIX. I mean, you know, VIX and, and particularly the pros, like someone like, um, I think, Tracy Alloway is following VIX futures much more even than... Spot VIX market. Very cool. I'll whip through yeah. this price action briefly, Please. Tom, and we'll get to it. Up about mm -hmm. eight or nine tenths of one percent on the S and P 500 on the Nasdaq 100, up one four percentage point. Down the last couple of days by about five percent on the Nasdaq. So brutal two days of losses, and here's the bounce back. You can turn the last couple of days upside down in the bond market too. Yields come back in three basis points on a ten year <coughs> to three point zero six seven percent on a ten year. Euro dollar, Euro dollar firmer here by a third of one percent again. Lisa, we get German CPI out a little bit later. Spanish CPI just a little bit going into next week. Yeah, although yesterday we really saw that move in the euro go above parity after they came out with this uh, emergency plan to address the energy crisis in the region. How much is that really the linchpin of what happens with the euro and how much breathing space the ECB has when it comes to rates? What I'm watching today is some sort of reiteration of what we, what we heard from Neil Kashkari with Fed speak, including Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin as well as John Williams of the New York Fed. They're speaking at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. respectively. Do they come out and repeat 
that they would like to see a little bit of more of a tightening in financial conditions. I also want to hear what they have to say about the balance sheet because the roll off really starts to take an ex uh, effect and accelerate much more this week. At what point do we see that trickle into the markets? Today, we will be very focused on the housing market. We get U.S. FHA house price index uh, for the month of June as well as house prices from S&P CoreLogic. At 9 a.m., the U.S. August Conference Board and uh, Consumer Confidence as well as JOLTS come out at 10 a.m. How much do the job openings continue to decline? This is what a lot of people are looking at for sort of the peripheral evidence of a softening in the labor market. And today, earnings continue best buy before the market. HP and Chewy after the bell. Just to give you a sense of the insanity of Bed Bath & Beyond, the shares are up 131% so far this month. This is a record gain. Talking about meme craziness, this is the really emblematic one and how much can they actually show a fundamental performance. John, perhaps reducing some of the things that they have at their stores or lowering the numbers of shelves. Or I just said it's overwhelming. It's not a yeah, comment on the stock. It's just a comment on the experience when you go into the store. That's all. It's been my experience I'm just, I'm, ever I'm, since I'm, I moved here. I, I don't think you're wrong. I think a lot of people would agree. And what you were seeing with Bed Bath & Beyond fundamentally is they've had to cut the prices so much on their inventory because it's all there stacking up. Too much like. stuff from floor to ceiling. Bramo, thank you. Russ Kostrick joins us now, Portfolio Manager for the BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. Russ, let's start here, sir. Can you give me a couple of reasons, maybe even one, to be bullish right now? <laughs> uh, good morning. Bullish, how about... Uh, it could be worse. Look, I, I, I think that right now to have a really bullish case that you know we're, we're heading back up to double-digit gains is hard. Uh, we've got tight, tighter financial conditions that are likely to continue to tighten. Earnings are holding up, but you, you can't be as constructive on earnings if the economy is slowing. Having said all that, you know what is, if not bullish, at least gives you some confidence that you may have already put in the bottom. Valuations are more reasonable. Uh, we probably have a reasonable side of where the terminal Fed funds rate is. And corporate earnings have been resilient. So I don't think that's a bullish call. Mm -hmm. It's probably more of a muddle through call. Russ, a theory question here on a quiet day in August. Given the trauma that's out there, is it better to be more or less diversified? Is it a time to really focus on picking few quality bets or to spread it around? I think it's actually about idiosyncratic risk time. Actually, it's a great question. It's something we've been spending a lot of time yeah. doing. So what we've been doing in the portfolio is we've actually taken a lot of what I'll call the macro risk down. We're running pretty close to neutral, a little underweight in equities. We're underweight duration, but not as much as we have been. So I think the short answer to your question is we've been increasing the risk associated with high conviction idiosyncratic yeah. bets. Uh, either credit that we have confidence in that's going to give us carrying the portfolio or high quality companies, a lot of them what we call stable growth with pricing power. So between taking big macro bets and taking more idiosyncratic risk, right now we're definitely in the yeah. latter camp. Lisa, this is so, so, so important given trauma, what you do with the count and the allocation in your portfolio. But the question is, how do you get scale, especially for a place like BlackRock, Russ? Can you do enough with respect to the investments of idiosyncratic stocks, of idiosyncratic credits at a time of little liquidity in order to generate the kinds of returns that you need to offset having a, a pretty low conviction in the rest of the portfolio? Well, it's hard. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is not a market that you, you characterize as particularly liquid. Having said that, the market has given you opportunities. You know, we had days like last Friday uh, where you saw a lot of, you know, pain in the market. Some of it you could understand. Others, we, we felt like, you know, the, the baby was being thrown out with the bathwater and there were good opportunities to pick up some of those stable growth companies that we like. So you have to be opportunistic. You have to be patient, and you have to realize that this probably is going to go on for a bit. How much cash do you hold in, Russ? We hold less cash than we did. So at one point during the summer, you know, we were well well above 20% on our cash level. We've actually brought that down now, uh, probably more around the high teens. So still a very big cash balance. Uh, there's a few reasons, reasons we're doing that, one of which is having the dry powder because we do think volatility continues into the fall. But the other, and we've spoken about this in other broadcasts, you know, no one loves cash. It's a hard asset class to hold in a, in a high inflation environment. You don't want to have it forever. But in a world in which treasuries are still not giving you the same hedging characteristics they used to, cash is helping to mitigate 
uh, portfolio risk along with a long dollar position. That's how we're managing risk right now, and it, it, it is working. I know someone who loves it. Russ, thank you. Russ Kostrick at BlackRock. Thank TK, you. loving cash. TK, over in Europe, here's the call from Danske Bank. They're now looking for a 75 basis <clears throat> point rate hike on the September yeah. 8th meeting. They go to 75. The story's changed very quickly yeah. in the last week. And this is a really important shop. This is a different shop than the major shops. They've taken a more what I call conservative, not Austrian tack, to look at their economic theory, but they stick out like a sore thumb. They're the kind of bank, John, you read just to make your mind go. They've got a different angle, a different cut on it, and when they publish, it's important. This quote here, Lisa, we believe the Eurozone will face a recession and the ECB will hike into that. However, However, we also acknowledge that even without the ECB tightening, the European economy was in a severe situation to begin with, with a worsening, worsening energy crisis. The situation over there, and they're willing to hike into it big time. We've gone from what? Thinking they might hike 15 basis points six yeah. months ago <laughs> to staring down the barrel of a 75. And a quantitative tightening over in the Eurozone at the same time that they completely reverse a decade of negative rates. How much are we also looking at permanent fiscal support at a time of devastating energy bills. I mean, we were talking about this yesterday, John, and I gave a lot of thought to this last night. This isn't going to be a one-time bailout for the consumer. This is something that is going to have a protracted effect on the fiscal balance sheet of uh, Europe. And how do you sort of factor in the ECB's role in lowering borrowing costs amid all of this? The Shell CEO in the last couple of days, it may well be that we have a number of winters where we have to somehow find solutions through efficiency savings, through rationing, and as a very, very quick build out of alternatives, that this is going to be somehow easy or over, I think is fantasy that we should put aside. That's the Shell CEO yeah. on the situation in Europe and beyond. Futures bouncing back up 1% on the S&P this morning. Good morning to you all. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. It would be the largest transfer of U.S. weapons to Taiwan in almost two years. Bloomberg's learned the Biden administration is preparing to sell $1.1 billion in missiles and radar support. The sale doesn't offer Taiwan any new military capacity. Still, it's likely to lead to more protests from China. President Biden will deliver a primetime speech Thursday slamming Republicans for what he sees as their threats to U.S. rights and freedoms. According to a White House official, the president will speak about the continued, quote, battle for the soul of the nation. He's trying to boost Democrats' chances in the November elections. And Ukraine has launched an offensive along the southern front of its war with Russia. The Ukrainian military says its artillery hit Russian positions around the Kherson region. Kherson is a river port that was one of the first cities to fall to Russian troops. The European Union plans to intervene in the energy market after electricity prices soared almost tenfold in one year. According to Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, the bloc wants to limit prices in the short term. In the long term, it will sever the link between gas and electricity costs. Goldman Sachs warns that the downturn in the U.S. housing market has further to go. In a research note, Goldman says it expects home price growth to average 0% next year due to higher mortgage rates and reduced affordability. But the firm says that large price declines are unlikely. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I certainly was not excited to see the stock market rallying uh, after our last uh, Federal Open Market Committee meeting because I know how committed we all are to getting inflation down and I somehow think the markets were misunderstanding that and I was actually happy to see how Chair Powell's Jackson Hole speech was received. You know, people now understand the seriousness of our co commitment to getting inflation back down to 2%. Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed president, speaking to Bloomberg's Odd Lots podcast with Tracy Alloway and Joe Weissenthal. Fantastic conversation. Bramo, to hear it, the quiet bit, out loud like that, can we call that refreshing? Just say it. If that's what you want, just say it. 
I was going to say the exact same thing. Is there a gauge to understand whether the market gets it? And yes, Neil Kashkari said, absolutely, it is the market, just like you suspected. I'm not endorsing it or telling him he shouldn't do it. I'm just saying they've basically been doing it for a long, long time, and they should probably just say well, the quiet bit out loud, Tom. Yeah, and what's important here, and we saw that at Jackson Hole, one of the great things about the ginormous lobby there with the big, tall bear and, you know, hang, hanging out with all these people, you don't really talk to them. They're just like, you know, Bill Dudley's over there and Neil Kashkari's over there. John, all these presidents are, are uniquely different. This is, an, this is an aerospace guy. This is not some, you know, Ph.D. economist being hedging and all that. Kashkari says what he wants. Well, he's telling us what he really thinks. Right yeah. now, futures are bouncing back, up nine-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. I don't think Kashkari is going to give you intraday commentary on single-day market moves, although maybe he will in a few <laughs> days. <laughs> Lisa's all in waiting for that. Beyond. Yields lower by about four basis points, 3.0633% <clears throat> on a US 10-year. This from Elon Musk as it regards oh, to God, Twitter, really? the latest. Musk sending an additional notice of termination of the merger agreement with Twitter. The new letter highlighting additional reasons to terminate the merger agreement, according to the filing. Looking at the stock price move off the back of some of this, Bramo, Twitter down by about 2.6%. $39 in the pre-market. If you've forgotten, not sure you have, but if you have, 54.20 was the agreed price. So we are nowhere near it, Lisa. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have expected this. The question is just whether or not there will have to be a billion-dollar breakup fee that will be paid and what the damage has been done to Twitter in the meantime, reputationally as well as with morale, with a lot of people quitting are getting pushed out. 39.23, Tom, in the pre-market. We're down about 2%. We covered that. Thank you. Hey, John, is this in the court just, they go to the court and the court says enough, this is what we're going to decide? I mean, it, that's, is that, that's the resolution you'd like to see, yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm on I board. Don't I don't know. Get it done. Let's do this right now. And this dovetails nicely with Greg Villiers' last note of the summer before he waltzes off to a Labor Day holiday like Lisa's taking. Villiers saying all of a sudden the Democrats have an advantage in the Senate and actually have a hope and prayer in the House as well. Emily Wilkins has actually left the Beltway. She's gone out to the tundra of the 8th Congressional District in Pennsylvania, which is really the story of this nation. Emily, let's describe it. Mr. Biden knows this well. Scranton is uh, to a great affinity for him, and southwest on 81 in Scranton is Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. This is the land of Matt Cartwright which he won by 51.8 percent. This is a Democrat who barely won in a nine-plus Trump uh, district. What did you learn there as you reported on his desperation to do it again? So the fascination here, I think, with particularly Congressman Matt Cartwright, is that he's a Democrat who has done for many years what Democrats really need to do now. He has won consistently in a Trump district. And this year, it's going to be a really difficult year for him. Those national headwinds, they've been against Democrats. When I spoke with him uh, recently, this past weekend, he seemed very confident about things, about his ability to do so. Sure, some of it's the retail politicking, the local level, being able to uh, show what wins that you've gotten. But on the other hand, Democrats have a larger number of wins they can point to now. Now that they've passed that health care and tax bill, now that they've passed that semiconductor shortage bill, they've got a number of things that they can look at. Plus, they can, they're can they starting to feel a little bit more comfortable with inflation. It still is a Republican talking yeah. point. It's still something that they're going, they need to figure out a way to message on. Uh, but they were very relieved uh, to see the July numbers and it leveling but, off. But Emily, what's so important here is this guy is so far from the Liberal caucus. We talked to Patrick Leahy uh, yesterday on surveillance, and so is Senator Leahy. Senator Leahy said the Democrats have to move to the middle where Matt Cartwright is. What are the liberals going to do between now and the first Tuesday of November? You know, it's actually interesting because Matt Cartwright is technically a member of the House Progressive Caucus. Uh, granted, the Progressive Caucus is 95 members. It's actually pretty broad when it comes to ideological scope. But I think it kind of talks about that a lot of this is going to be in the messaging. What issues do you focus on? How do they frame their campaign? What do they talk about? Are they are Democrats able to get away from that inflation, inflation, inflation message that Republicans are going to be pushing? And I think to a certain extent, I mean, Tom, it's a really great question. And you've seen this particularly in some of the recent Senate campaigns, with lawmakers like Tim Ryan coming out and criticizing Biden's move to cancel $10,000 of, of student debt for certain borrowers. And you have seen this division between some of the more moderate Democrats as well as, and from President Biden. But at the end, I mean, part of this is going to be that everyone needs to run their own race. It's a bit of a cliche, but when the margins are going to be this tight, when things are looking this close, it's absolutely true. Emily Wilkins, thank you. 
down in Washington, D.C. I think we all have one question going into year end. What are they going to do when unemployment, when, not if, when unemployment starts moving the other way? This is what the White House press secretary had to say yesterday. We don't want to step on the Federal Reserve and what they're going to do. Our goal is to keep bringing down inflation without sacrificing the historic and life-changing economic gains that we've seen this country has made over the last 18 months. I wonder how long they can maintain the first part of that if the second part of it, Tom, starts reversing. Well, I'm so glad, John, you read this garbage. Just, well, someone has to, just, TK. I just, what was the last line she said? The last line of it was, our goal is to keep bringing down inflation without sacrificing the historic and life-changing economic gains that we've seen this country has made over the last the life -changing, 18 months. Lisa Albier, you know the chart. The life, the life-changing gains is the integrand of negative wage growth we haven't seen, I'll say, in 40 years. I mean, well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not laughing. I don't think it's garbage. I think that it's really a relevant point, which is that inflation is a really big problem for a lot of people. And right now, that is the preeminent problem because we are not seeing the job losses, uh, John, that you're talking about. And this is really the dual mandate. Basically, the Fed has cover by the White House and by economics and by where we are in the cycle to keep raising rates. But until when? And that really is what the market is betting is that they are not going to have that cover next year. That's what we heard yesterday from Megan Swiver, where she said, we don't think that the Fed's reaction function's in question, but the economy is not going to cooperate, and they're going to have to re-engage uh, with some sort of Fed rate cutting. I mean, how much is really that the debate that we're going to be facing? She disagreed with the forecast yesterday. Yeah. I think most people would agree on this program. The Senator Warren is unlikely to be alone, talking about the kind of things that she was talking about over the weekend to CNN, blaming the Fed, finding a scapegoat for the rolling over of the economy. <laughs> She's likely to have some company. The White House is just saying, you're too early. <laughs> yeah, the White House has given them cover for now. Right, exactly. For now. Futures up eight or nine tenths of 1% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. from New York City this morning. Good morning. Turning the last couple of days upside down. Futures bouncing back up nine tenths of one percent on the S&P up by 1.2 percent on Nasdaq 100 futures. Over the previous two days we were down four percent on the S&P down five percent on the Nasdaq 100. So this is a small bounce relative to the losses we've seen over the last couple of days. Bit of a turnaround in the bond market as well. We'll take a snapshot of bonds for you. Treasuries twos tens and thirties. Yields come in just a little bit on a two year down a basis point to 340. 89 came very, very close to the closing high of the year yesterday. Just short of it. 342.67 yeah. was the June 14th closing high on a two-year. Finished just short of that yesterday after getting very close to 350 intraday. Short of that, the high of the session oh, about John, 348, Tom. I'm glad you bring this up because the same thing happened with dollar-yen. Yen finally broke yen weaker and exactly the same. The yen didn't break through the July 14th week yen uh, moment. What does it signal, John, that we're seeing a set of series but right up against their constraints. Things They're... fading a little bit, Tom, yeah. but the question I asked yesterday, <clears throat> and I'll ask it repeatedly again today, we came very close to the highs of June 14th on a two-year yield. Do we have to come very close to the lows of June 16th in the equity market? And we'll see how that develops through the rest of the year, Tom. Looking elsewhere, we need to look to Europe, the euro, sterling. Think about this in Europe. We're going to look at a 75 basis point rate hike potentially from the ECB. That's Danske Bank a little bit earlier this morning. Euro dollar firmer this morning, stronger by a half of 1%. Spanish CPI fading just a little bit from the previous month, year over year. We're looking for German CPI in about 90 minutes from now. I want to finish on the UK too. Sterling, very close to a 116 handle, a 117.31. Also stronger against the US dollar. But credit card growth, Reuters reporting on that this morning. The fastest annual pace of growth going back to 2005. And Tom, annually, that rate of growth yeah. is 13%. And the pushback from the likes of Equifax, the credit rating agency for individuals, Tom, it's basically saying for a lot of consumers right now, Tom, things are getting so hard, they're I turning agree. to credit yes. cards. Yes. You turn to credit cards in a rising interest rate environment, Tom, this is yeah. a very, very tough spot for a lot of people, and it's getting tougher yeah. in Europe. And, and you're going to see it, John, in airlines, too. I'm going to give credit to Lizanne Saunders. I saw it out in the zeitgeist somewhere, where unit sales of domestic and international plane tickets are down, and down big. Who can keep paying these prices, Tom? Yeah. 
Yeah. Big question. Well, there it is. And David Rosenberg, our interview of the day on inflation, we'll do that here in a bit. Right now, we advance that discussion with Lindsay Piegs, a chief economist at Stiefel. Lindsay, I'm going to rip up the script here. I can do this uh, with you. David Rosenberg is noted for his partition of inflation, slicing it into 10, 20, 30 different partitions. Do you see a set of partitions in price change that gets us to a rapid disinflation? I, I think it's very difficult to say that we're going to see a meaningful retreat in price pressures given the broad broad-based increase. Now, yes, there will be some categories where prices will slow their pace of ascension, and that will give the Fed at least uh, pause that they are starting to see that more positive implication from earlier policy changes. But again, when we talk about a one-tenth, two-tenth headline decline, that's not the meaningful right. retreat that the Fed is looking for in order to change that more accelerated pathway that they've been focused There's on. There's eight ways to measure this, but let's go to headline inflation, which I think our viewers and listeners have in their head, which is not 13 percent to come in London, but the idea of eight or nine percent inflation. Is it an easy task for the microcosm or the microeconomics to get us back to, say, 6.9 percent from 8.5 percent? No, I, I think it's going to be very difficult. And the chairman touched on this in his comments on Friday, noting that price pressures are coming from both the demand and the supply side. And while the Fed can work to control and dampen demand, dampen consumption and investment, raising the cost of borrowing or raising the federal funds rate will do nothing to address the supply side of the equation. And so the Fed is going to face an increasingly more difficult challenge this time around than in previous cycles to get inflation under control and, again, back down that nearer 2 percent target range. How far does the unemployment rate have to rise, in your view, in order to get uh, back to that level that the Fed would like to get to? Well, I think a lot of it is going to be the duration that the Fed remains on this upward trajectory to higher rates. If it's going to take a year or longer in order to get inflation back below uh, this this uh, this range that, that we've seen, I think the unemployment rate could easily go up near 5 percent, maybe higher. Right now at 3.5 percent, that is markedly low. And as the chairman said, he is expecting for labor market conditions to soften. And that means a meaningful upward then trend in the unemployment rate. And the reason why I ask this is because there's a sort of perfect soft landing scenario that the Fed is looking for, where you get a greater participation rate, people coming back into the market, lowering the price uh, pressure for wages, and leading to a disinflationary nirvana where nobody has to lose their jobs. Is that likely in any scenario in your view? I think that's the utopic uh, scenario, and I think that's certainly a, a goal that the Fed is looking for. But I think the idea of a soft landing or even a soft-ish landing has been now reduced to very low single probabilities at this time. As the Fed told us, he is anticipating and they are anticipating a period of prolonged weakness where there will be ample pain for businesses and individuals. We're already seeing growth trending negative. The consumer, in terms of real ter uh, after adjusting for inflation, so real terms trending down towards negative territory. Uh, even if we did see the participation rise and absorb some of that artificial slack in the labor market, I, I do think it's optimistic to right. suggest that the Fed will be able to navigate positive uh, activity anytime soon going forward. Lindsay, we've got a banner that we're putting out here in the dog days of August, which is real articulate. It's August. Okay, so you're sitting around trying to get to September. What is the biggest data mystery you have after Labor Day? I think there's some big data reports, not only on Friday, awaiting the non-farm payroll reports, but it's going to be the August inflation numbers that really determine what whether part or not of those? the market. I don't mean to cut you off, but like, is it a Dallas Tribune part of that? Is it Cleveland inflation? What part of that inflation reports the mystery? No, I, I think the Fed is going to be focused on the headline number. That's what's going to be driving market expectations and, by extension, then, what the Fed feels comfortable implementing come September. Because, remember, while the Fed has left the door open for an unusually large increase, to use their words, they also said it's going to be meeting to meeting. And with the market ping-ponging very dramatically between expectations for a 50 and 75 basis point, one data point will be able to tip the scale in one direction or the other. So if we see the August inflation numbers come in 
well under expectations in terms of providing the second month of cooling price pressures, I think that redirects expectations back to 50 basis points or less, and the Fed will capitulate, allowing that, that lesser increase given those reduced market expectations. I have to be honest, Lindsay, the 50 versus 75 basis point discussion is not as interesting to me, especially at a time when all of a sudden the balance sheet roll off is set to accelerate and it's set to accelerate this week and nobody's talking about it. Fed officials really did not address what they thought the ramifications would be, except to point out this paper highlighting how much this would draw liquidity out of the market. What is the ramification in your view economically from the balance sheet roll off set to accelerate? Well, I do think that the, the balance sheet roll-off will help to not necessarily provide upward pressure, additional upward pressure on the long end, but help to provide a floor. So as the Fed goes forward, continuing with these rate increases, even as we see the intentional move to undermine economic growth, coupled with the balance sheet roll-off, I think the Fed will be able to control a massive downward ascent that we could have otherwise seen on the longer end of the curve. Now, the Fed isn't necessarily focused on that because they don't see that as the primary tool right now. The Fed is focused on raising that federal funds rate back to a more normal level. And given the still modest level of roll-off, I think that, again, the Fed is focused on more traditional policy metrics. But going forward, should the Fed need additional momentum, I think the balance sheet becomes uh, a, a very key component of that policy increase. Lindsay, thank you. Lindsay Pierre really, there. Really good. Stiefel. And Lisa, to build on what you were saying, Diane Swank of KPMG messaged me yesterday, and she also agrees with you that it's much, much bigger than just September you guys aren't alone. Diane had this to say. The amount the Fed raises rates in September is less important than the direction and the resolve to slow economic growth below potential and raise unemployment. That's what everybody's got to grapple with. It's not just September 50 or 75. It's the damage it's going to do to this economy to get unemployment up and to get inflation down. Yeah, talk about short-term memory, right? Because that was the whole point of the Jackson Hole speeches, one after another, 50, 75, it doesn't really matter, but we're gonna hold them wherever they land for a very long time, right? right? And yet we still heard the Megan Swibers of the world, John, pushing back and saying, okay, but their forecasts are wrong. So even though they might actually go through with this intellectually, in a practical sense, right. they're still gonna cut rates. Well, be of A, Tom. Hard landing. That's the call from Bank of America and the team. Yeah, I'm with Danny Blanche Flower on this, John. This is really important. The, the beautiful comment you had there from Diane Swank and, and the analysis to Alan Meltzer assumes a homogenous American labor economy. I just flat out disagree with that. To me, it's wildly partitioned, and I would focus on a part of the American economy. I'm going to put it at an amateur 60 percent that is flat on their back right now. I don't think you can look at this as an, in an aggregate basis. So the Fed is telling you what they want to see. It gets more controversial when you start to see it. Yeah. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to communicate to everyone, Lisa, that higher unemployment is the price worth paying to get inflation down. And you can already see certain politicians taking advantage of this situation, ready to basically frame the Federal Reserve as the scapegoat for what's going to come down the road. Yeah, you're talking about Elizabeth Warren front and center, and she won't be alone. But right now, they have to get this through. And, and this sort of goes to the heart of the conundrum for the Federal Reserve. How long does it take for monetary policy to take effect in the economy? In other words, once you see the effects, once you see unemployment rising to that 5% <clears throat> level that we just heard from Lindsay Piazza, then is it too late for them? to reverse course quickly, right? Or is this something that's already carried away? This is pretty gloomy stuff, but there is some better news out there for the equity market bulls. You have a bounce this morning, up 34 on the S&P, up 8 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ futures up by 1.16%. Live from New York with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow for our audience worldwide. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Billionaire Elon Musk has sent a letter to Twitter adding reasons why he wants to terminate his takeover agreement. Musk says that Twitter may have breached their deal in five more ways. The letter was sent after a whistleblower alleged that the company didn't know or care to find out how many of its users were spam or robot accounts. The U.S. says that a controlled shutdown at the Ukrainian nuclear power, point seized, power plant seized by the Russians would be the safest option. Artillery shells continue to land near the plant. Meanwhile, International Atomic Energy Agency monitors will assess the damage and account for nuclear material at the reactor. 
The European Union is set to meet its gas storage filling goal two months ahead of its target. The bloc is bracing for a tough winter with Russia limiting supplies and energy prices soaring. Gas storage helps absorb supply shocks and provides up to 30% of fuel consumed in winter. China is battling COVID in every province despite its use of the world's strictest measures to keep the virus out. All 31 mainland provinces recorded at least one local COVID case over the past 10 days. That's the broadest exposure to the virus since early 2021. Restrictions have been increasing around Beijing and in Shenzhen, China's southern technology hub. And in tennis, Serena Williams won her first match at what is expected to be her last U.S. Open in New York. The winner of six U.S. Open championships defeated Danka Konovic 6-3, 6-3. Williams is 40. She says she wants to concentrate on venture capital firm and on having a second child. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The skyrocketing electricity prices are now exposing, for different reasons, the limitations of our current electricity market design. That's why we, the Commission, are now working on an emergency intervention. Better late than never, Ursula von der Leyen there, the European Commission president on the energy crisis unfolding in Europe. From New York City this morning, good morning, Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures up eight tenths on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq 100, up around about 1.15% on the Nasdaq. Yields coming back in, down four basis points, 3.0614%. And we turn around on crude, down 1.9%. Tom, let's call it 95.20 on WTI. I'm going to say still, John, Brent 102 with a little bit higher level earlier. This has been the quiet story of August. I don't think anybody's I'm with you, Tom. You've been on top of it, of it too. Yeah, Triple digit crude back on the table. Yeah, I think it's tangible. Right now, we're going to dive into this with someone truly engaged in the future of hydrocarbons. Robert Yager is executive director for Energy Futures at Mizuho Americas. He is someone who's not looking at the macro and what Saudi Arabia is going to do and all that. It's actually the flow of the stuff we use. Robert Yager, I want to go to Louisiana and where nine pipelines cross where long ago and far away, they built a, a hub district for Texaco called Henry Hub. You are expert at Henry Hub. What does Henry Hub in the New York, the national idea of our pipelines, our flow movement, what does it tell you about the price of oil in the dead of winter February? Well, we have a, a couple of things working for us, a couple of things working against us heading into winter. Last week, the best performing financial instrument on the street was distillate. That's basically heating oil. The worst performing instrument on the street, actually second worst, was gasoline. <clears throat> we are going to head into winter with storage at a very low level. We are threatening to, to see distillate storage fall below 100 million for the first time since 2003 heading into winter. At the same time, we have, it's the end of driving season and we have plenty of gasoline. Gasoline is falling fast on the commodity side. And we have to, refiners have to figure out how to feather those two moving pieces moving right. in opposite directions. They have to figure out how to make more distillate and still not make a whole lot of gasoline that kills the golden goose. Gasoline is the golden goose. I mean, it's a golden goose, and I'll you know, give it. We went up to 120, we come back down, and we're, right now we're midpoint 100. I don't want you to game the price of oil, but I want you to game the urgency that's out there. Even at this level, we need to do something. What's the actual do something of the distillate, the downstream space? It's, it's, it's a tough call, because when you run a barrel of crude oil through the refinery, you make two times more gasoline then you make distillate. Right now, a barrel of distillate is worth $66. A barrel of gasoline this morning is worth $15. You can't make more gasoline. Refiners are really in a tight spot. If they continue to add gasoline to storage, 
they're going to kill this gasoline market. And they have a lot of gasoline, basically two times more gasoline in stores than they have distillate. You don't want to kill that gasoline market. On the other hand, the refiners are already taking heat heading into winter from the government, from the Department of Energy, because they are so far behind on distillate storage. At the same time they're behind on distillate storage, Henry Hub Natural Gas is trading at t close to $10 at a 14-year high. So we're threatening really high heating oil crisis heading into winter. We think we have an inflation problem now with gasoline, especially earlier in the summer. We're going to have an inflation oh. problem with heating oil element in winter time that is going to that threatens to to to, to strangle people's bills. Well, so uh, that's what we're looking forward to. Right, looking forward to is one way to put it. Uh, perhaps yeah. this is the context for Jennifer, Jennifer Granholm's comments about perhaps not exporting some of the natural gas to Europe in order to protect the pricing power and, and the ability to keep things under control heading into the winter. How realistic is this and how connected are these higher heating costs in the U.S. to what's been going on over in Europe? It's, it's, it's very connected. It's, there's a correlation to everything. We are moving as many molecules of natural gas to the Eurozone to make up for Russian gas as we can. Problem is, the Europeans don't have a lot of takeaway. We can't really jam many more molecules of, of natural gas into the Eurozone. They're trying to catch up as fast as they can now. They finally realize they have to get off the Russian pipe and they have to join the, basically the rest of the world on uh, LNG. We were selling good amounts of LNG to South Korea, Japan, and China uh, up to the crisis in uh, Ukraine. And we've had to switch those deliveries basically to the Eurozone as fast as we can. It's not easy. Those, uh, those deals to the Asian countries were on long-term deals. And in the meantime, we lost one of our largest uh, LNG facilities in the Gulf Coast at Freeport. And um, we're trying to catch up. Now, at the same time, distillate, we, we take, uh, well, we, 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 we blend about 4 million barrels a day, uh, demands about 4 million barrels a day. Last week, one, we sent 1.6 million of that out as exports. So a very high percentage of our, of our demand was exported. That's what she's upset about yep. because those barrels should be going into storage right now and catching up. Um, I can't stress enough how, how bad this is going in that we, if we fall below 100 million barrels, let's say in October or even by Thanksgiving, how are we going to catch up? How can you expect that distillate prices to be at a relatively... It's going to be very level. tough. And Robert, that's why so many people are asking a question about how do you reconcile the foreign policy goals with the domestic energy issues. Robert, great to catch up. Let's do this again. Very detailed stuff. Robert Yorker there of Mizuho Americas. Get in a headline on China. China Party Congress that will yeah. pick the leadership set for October 16th. We were waiting for that date, Tom. We have that date, TK. It is October 16th. I think it dovetails well. I'm writing up a note here. I think we ought to take surveillance to Shanghai, which is going to be the focal point. John, Hong Kong's not going to be the focal point. Beijing's not going to be the focal point as a federal location. Shanghai's going to be the focal point of the kind of city, including all the Western cities, that are going to react from that party congress. At least if you fancy a trip to China right now, October 16th, can you imagine? If there is a COVID case ahead of October 16th, what's going to happen in some of those cities? <laughs> yeah, well, this is the question, right? Do they announce the end of some of the zero COVID, or is it going to just be lockdown after lockdown ahead of that and then protracted afterwards? I mean, we're already hearing about that ongoing rolling lockdowns, even as the cases decline, simply because they do not want a COVID outbreak ahead of that party Congress. Here's the deal. Tom, we'll let you go first, see if you get in. Yeah. That's, you know, and then you can do the see show if from I get there. In. And well, you know. let, let Tom go first and then Lisa and I will stay here. Yvonne, man, and I can do it. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure. sorry, this you is going to be a big deal. You're, we're going to be in a hotel Steve quarantining Angle up there? for like three weeks. Yeah, but it's comfortable. I'll take show. a pass <laughs> and I'll just cover the markets from here. Yeah. Okay. I pay tense on the S&P. From here? Future's from positive. <laughs> from bed. <laughs> I've always dreamt about doing that. On the Nasdaq, <laughs> at 1.14%. From New York City Pretty this big. morning, this is Bloomberg.
Powell delivered this very clear message that the Fed is going to do what it takes to get inflation down, even if that means pain for businesses and households. We think it's good that the Fed is doing what it's doing. It's on the case. It's going after inflation. If we really get weakness, if we get jobs going down, they will have to backtrack. We certainly haven't seen the earnings collapse that many of the bears have predicted. So right now, increased volatility. It will be a September to remember, but I think we will get through this okay. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Lisa has emailed Neil to tell him stocks are higher, just to find out what he thinks about that. Live from New York City <laughs> this morning. Idea. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Stocks passing back up eight tenths of one percent. Fascinating conversation with the Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari and our colleagues Tracy Alloway and Joe Weissenthal. The Fed President Tom was happy to see the stock market reaction to Chairman Powell and Jackson Hole over the weekend. Yeah, he was. I mean, and there's going to be a lot of that in Kashkari. You know, they're all different. He can talk the line he, he wants to talk. But I think it's very, very typical. It's in the back of the economic textbooks, John. But the markets matter to monetary policy. That is iconic within classic economic textbooks. It is the quiet bit out loud, Lisa. I certainly was not excited to see the stock market rallying after our last Federal Open Market Committee meeting. So here's the question for me. And I'll ask this question of our guest in just a moment. If I'm bullish stocks, am I fighting the Fed right now? Well, Megan uh, Swiper would say, no, you're basically just saying that you see a different economic outlook than what they do. And how much is this really the root uh, belief that a lot of bulls have, which is the uh, economy is not going as gangbusters as the Fed thinks. You're going to see a disinflationary kind of tilt that's bigger than people expected heading into the winter. Oh, and by the way, things are going to get so bad by next year that the Fed's going to be have to uh, reverse course and pivot and cut rates, even though they're saying we're not going to do that. So, I mean, how much is that basically what you're doing? Not fighting the Fed, but fighting the economic outlook that they're basically using to formulate their case. Bank of America says hard landing. So this is the line from them. Yes, the yes. Fed wants to reduce inflation and will risk a recession to restore price stability. Hard landing the call from them. I, John, I don't know. It's 7.02 a.m. And, you know, you look at Bank of America, you look at all of it out there and the, the level of gloom. I mean, it is 7.02 BGT. There's no question. Well, Tom, you it. tell me. Give me Brand one reason to time. be bullish. And it's the only reason to be bullish right now the, that everyone else is bearish. The number. No, that is true. And you're right. That is not a sufficient condition. I would suggest corporations will adapt in a shocking manner. We'll see. If they can adapt, we'll futures see. right now up eight tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we bounced back by one four percentage point over the last couple of days. Down about five percent on the Nasdaq, down four percent on the S&P 500. Yields were higher now; they're lower by four or five basis points to three point zero five five eight percent. The two-year backing off as well after coming very close to the closing high of the year. In the FX market, euro dollar one zero zero thirty four, positive about four tenths of one percent. Spanish CPI fades. We get the eurozone figure tomorrow. German CPI. Lisa, about 57 minutes away. Yeah, and how much do we get a sense that perhaps things are t uh, topping out, peaking out uh, south of 9% over in Germany, which is sort of a shocking number right now, considering where it has been over the past few decades. We've got a whole host of Fed speak today, just in case you didn't get enough over the weekend. And at the end of last week, we've got uh, Thomas Barkin of the Richmond Fed, as well as John Williams, New York Fed president. How much do they talk about the balance sheet? I keep talking about this. Tom Barkin speaking at 8, uh, John Williams speaking at 11 a.m. Eastern, do they talk about the expectation of what they think we'll see as we start to accelerate the runoff, which should happen this week? We really haven't seen a big drawdown in that $9 trillion balance sheet until now. Today, we get a host of economic data, slew of housing data at 9 a.m., including house price uh, data from the S&P CoreLogic unit. How much do we get a sense of a stopping out in some of the price gains and even potentially starting to fall versus just a deceleration? We also get consumer confidence at 10 a.m., as well as jolts, John Job openings. How much do we see them continue to come down? How much is this basically the soft way of uh, taking out some of the froth in the labor market to bring down the wage pressures that actually could help with that soft landing uh, Goldilocks scenario? And today we've got a slew of earnings. Best Buy just came out. They did better than expected or less worse than expected, and their shares are popping. Uh, just before I looked, when I looked at them, uh, a little bit more than 11 percent in pre-market trading. We also have HP and Chewy after the bell. I'm curious about HP. 
in particular, how much is, John, the demand from companies for hard, uh, hard, uh, uh, hardware going down as they start to pull back on some of their expenses heading into whatever kind of downturn people are expecting? How do consumers pull back yeah. with energy prices where they are? Lisa, thank you. Here's a headline you never want to have to say <laughs> as a policymaker. This from the UK. The Prime Minister's spokesperson, Tom. Households and businesses can be confident of yeah. gas and power supply. Tom, you never want to have to say those kind of things out loud. It's a unit and a flow basis. Did they talk about price? I don't think well, so. Well, let's talk about price, Tom. Astronomical. <laughs> and that's the problem for so many people. How many businesses, hey, TK, mean, are going to have to close confronting these kind of prices? All of our listeners and viewers are living this, and John is living it in real time, as there's so many others with Bloomberg on the continent and with family you know, spread out across all this. John, do you have a real confidence in a 13% inflation rate as quoted by Citigroup? Is it going to be more than that? City, Tom, looking really, for 18. More, really? City looking for 18. The Excuse Bank of me, England 18. looking for 13. Excuse so 13 is the baseline. Wow. I, see, baseline. I had that wrong, folks. I made that's my August mistake. But, Tom, honestly, once you get a 13%, what difference is an extra 5 percentage points? It's points. really Th important. 13 is dramatic enough, damaging enough by that point. They were in a lot of trouble. I, this is so important, folks, and this goes back to this homogenous, heterogeneous analysis. The Fed's talking is one America baloney. Let's get to Seb Page, shall we? Sebastian Page joins us now. Zero Price CIO and head of global multi asset. Sebastian, awesome to catch up. I'll ask that question I asked of Lisa. If I'm bullish stocks, am I fighting this Fed? You know, Lisa said that the Fed expects a gangbuster economy. I don't think that's the case. I actually think that not only is the Fed put gone, but there's a Fed call in the sense that any good news gets taken away by the Fed's need to <clears throat> tighten. So, yes, I think you are fighting the Fed if you're bullish. It's hard to find anybody that's bullish now on your show. I saw you try with prior guests today. I just came back from a trip to Australia and Japan, meeting with the world's largest, some of the world's largest pools of capital. And I couldn't get right. anybody to say anything optimistic about the economy or markets. So I'm not going to mince words. For our listeners and viewers, this is the most important conversation of the day because of your book, Beyond Diversification. Peter Lynch called it diversification, given the cards we have into the autumn into 2023, what character of diversification should we be right now? Over-diversified or a more focused effort to guess the right instruments? You know, Tom, I love that question. And the number one question around diversification is, will bonds, treasuries in particular, diversify stocks if we're heading towards recession risk? And I think they will. And in fact, we've closed our underweight bonds to go back to neutral. We've had a year where diversification between stocks and bonds has completely disappeared. The drawdown in bonds has been unprecedented, and the co-drawdown between stocks and bonds has shaken investors worldwide. So we do need to rethink portfolio construction. Tom, I would say we're going through a paradigm shift in terms of portfolio construction, and the role of bonds will be diminished. But to the extent we get growth shocks, you still want to own some treasuries. So, Sebastian, I, I want to clarify what I was trying to get at earlier when I was talking about the Fed. Basically, there is a belief that the economy is so strong that it can withstand and requires a big dose of pain in terms of how high rates go and how long they have to hold them there. That was sort of the message from Jackson Hole. And then they still reiterated the soft landing scenario uh, in one Fed official after another. The, the bull argument, ironically, is pushing back against that, seeing the deceleration already here, that things aren't that strong and it won't require as much pain as executed by the Fed. Do you believe that? I mean, basically, do you think that that's what people are doing right now and that you should lean against that and believe what they're saying and that basically bet on a hard landing right now? Look, I always say you should stay invested no matter what if your horizon is, say, longer than 12 months. But we are underweight stocks at the moment. We're watching this. We're not ready to get back in. Again, we are in stocks for the long run, but we are underweight. There are ways to play a more sort of soft landing scenario from a tactical asset allocation perspective, for example, through small caps. I think small caps are already pricing in a very deep recession. And so to the extent you get a recession, maybe they will go down with the market. And to the extent that you get anything that's not as bad as that, a soft or softest landing, then maybe you have some upside at some point with small caps. It takes some courage to lean in. 
but the valuation spread, look, large caps are in the 90th percentile of their historical valuation relative to small caps. So large caps expensive relative to small caps. Then you get a strong dollar, which tends to be more of a headwind for large caps. So there are ways to play offense, but I call it, I, I don't call it offense. I call it playing aggressive defense. And one thing I would say, Lisa, is there is no doubt the tone was hawkish. In fact, there was no new information in Jackson Hole in the speech. It was a short speech, no messy press conference to mix up the message, but definitely a hawkish tone. With You mentioned the word <clears throat> pain, resolve, unconditional. Powell mentioned price stability 10 times. How many times did he mention unemployment? Zero. We'll see and if that changes at the, the end of the year. And it was in the case of the cost of bringing inflation down. Yep. Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price said, well said, buddy, on a number of things. We'll see how many times unemployment gets a mention later this year if things turn around. <laughs> Doug Cass right again, and really echoing things we've said over the last couple of days. The last time the two-year yield was 340, the S&P 500 was 10% lower. And that's the story, Lisa. And I've asked that question a couple of times now. If we've taken out the highs briefly just yesterday, of the two year for the year, the highest being June 14th. Do we belong somewhere near the lows in the equity market of, say, June 16th? And be more specific, right? Is this the big tech players, perhaps, with the froth there being taken out because they've rallied that much more than that 10% uh, versus where we saw mid June levels? The headline from that conversation, Tom, you are fighting the Fed if you're bullish from Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price. Yeah, I mean, the Fed, it, it, there's been a game shift here. There's no question, no question about it. John Cerevelos publishes with Deutsche Bank. We'll do that when we come back. Let's pick up on that in just a moment, Tom. Looking forward to it. Up three quarters of 1% mm -hmm. on the S&P from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. It would be the largest transfer of U.S. weapons to Taiwan in almost two years. Bloomberg's learned the Biden administration is preparing to sell $1.1 billion in missiles and radar support. The sale doesn't offer Taiwan any new military capacity. Still, it's likely to lead to more protests from China. Ukraine has launched an offensive along the southern front of its war with Russia. The Ukrainian military says its artillery hit Russian positions around the Kherson region. Kherson is a river port that was one of the first cities to fall to Russian troops. In the UK, Chancellor of the Exchequer Nadim Zahawi is working on additional measures to help businesses and households with soaring energy bills. He spoke to Bloomberg TV. We know we need to do more because uh, by December, January, and then of course into next year, uh, those bills uh, will probably go up further. So I'm preparing options for the new incoming prime minister to be able to do even more. The new prime minister will be determined by a leadership vote in the Conservative Party that concludes next week. Billionaire Elon Musk has sent a letter to Twitter adding reasons why he wants to terminate his takeover agreement. Musk says that Twitter may have breached their deal in five more ways. The letter was sent after a whistleblower alleged that the company didn't know or care to find out how many of its users were spam or robot accounts. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Joe Biden wants to run again, I'll support him. He's uh, done a lot of great legislation passed. He's uh, uh, lowered the, the deficit in many ways. He's, and most importantly, he brought us back into the world of nations. Senator Patrick Leahy there, the Democrat from Vermont, from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up eight tenths of one percent. 
As someone reminded me on Twitter a little bit earlier, it is Turnaround Tuesday, a bounce back on the Nasdaq of more than 1%. We like that, don't we? Down 2.8% on crude, 94.29 on WTI. Yields coming back as well. You can turn the last couple of sessions upside down. Yields were higher. They're lower now by five basis points to 3.054%. Just a reminder, in about 42 minutes, you'll get German CPI, head of Eurozone CPI, going into that, the Euro, just a little bit stronger. Positive four-tenths, Tom, on Euro dollar, one zero zero. 35. You're fond of Germanic wisdom, and the answer there is the German two-year, which is worth following, John, hasn't gone out to new highs, but wow, what a move up. I think it's boss. quadrupled, Tom, yeah. this month alone. Have you a blast of Bloomberg Opinion out on Twitter That's this good. morning on the prospect of Europe intervening into the energy market? And he said this, Tom, quote, it's amazing the number of anti-market policies Germany is prepared to consider the very moment the market moves against Germany. That's Javier Blast, Tom, this yeah, morning. I wonder if, to borrow from Ian Bremmer, if it's every nation for itself, John, as you get towards, not November, but say January or February, it's going to be remarkable. Right now, we continue the American political discussion. We do this with Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government. And Emily, we do this off the wonderful 82-year-old Patrick Leahy, who visited with us yesterday, his new book, The Road Taken. And Emily, it was shocking to see Patrick Leahy harken back to Scoop Jackson and HHH of Minnesota and say the liberals have to have a dialogue with the conservatives. We're miles from that, aren't we? In some regards, yes. I mean, there is certainly a giant change that has happened in Capitol Hill basically since January 6th. Uh, and it really only seems like things are getting worse. This kind of leaves President Joe Biden in this really interesting position where he's kind of having to balance two different things. Number one, he ran as the unity candidate. He ran as someone who are going to unite Democrats and Republicans, get over the partisanship, get things done. To some degree, he has done that, right? The semiconductors bill, the infrastructure bill. At the same point, he's got this speech coming up in Philadelphia on Thursday where the whole crux of the speech is going to say that Republicans are bad for democracy, that they've gone too extreme, and he's dusting off his 2020 play book saying that people need to vote for him uh, more like vote what? for Democrats okay. because they need because democracy is on the ballot. This seems to be a zeitgeist thing right now. Great. I don't care about the zeitgeist. I care about the polls. Does the polling show a large body of America doesn't want to go for a core GOP ethos? At this point, the polls are pretty divided. I mean, it's still looking like Republicans are going to be able to take the House. But what Democrats are banking on is that if they can just show the American people that Republicans are extreme and tie even more moderate Republicans to the more extreme elements of the party, they think that's their best shot of winning. It's the message you're going to hear from Biden. It's a message you've already started hearing from Democrats across the country, save for perhaps a few who are in these really key swing states. Those are the ones that are bright purple, and, and they do preach a message a little bit more of bipartisanship and working together. And so it's kind of, it's a little bit of every man for himself. It depends what district you're running on as to which message you're going to pick up and use between now and November. One of my favorite charts these days in politics, Emily, is a map of the uh, gasoline prices superimposed over Joe Biden's approval rating. And you could see it tracks pretty closely, at least uh, in an inverse level. <laughs> How much do they have the ammunition? We've had 76 straight days of gasoline price declines that have uh, really worked in tandem with this brightening prospect for the Democratic Party. How much more is left from the people that you speak with? Is there a sense that this can really deliver what people are expecting in terms of a greater dominance this, this midterm election? I mean, Lisa, it's, it's a great thing to point out. I mean, it, you're absolutely right. As we've seen gas prices go down, we have also seen Biden's approval rating go up. That said, when I've asked folks about this, particularly Republicans, how do you feel? Is this going to be something that's a factor? What they've noted is, sure, gas prices are down from where they were earlier this year, but compared to where they were last year or two years ago, they are still up, and Americans are still feeling pressure and pain, maybe not so much at the pump, but still at the grocery store, for rentals, for mortgages, that those things are still high. And if you look at how the Biden administration, uh, their moves in the last couple of days, that letter that Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm sent out to oil refineries, gas is still very much on the Biden administration's mind. This is not something that they are putting a check in the box and saying mission accomplished. It's, it's good for Democrats that it has come down, but it's not going to guarantee them any sort of win in November when you're seeing other inflation still be high and gas prices still comparatively higher to what Americans have been used to for the last several Years. Emily, can I just finish on something that's been brought up a couple of times this morning? I'm not sure you'll find many people that come on this program that would describe the former president as the great unifier. The current president 
in his inaugural address back in January 2021, said this, I pledge this to you, I will be a president for all Americans. What do you make of some of the comments coming out of the White House and his party, including the governor here in the United States in New York, Governor Hochul, who's made some disparaging comments about certain Republicans and how they should go back to Florida? Emily, what do you make of the 74 million people who voted for the former president again in the past election who are facing some interesting comments from the current president? You know, John, that's a really good aspect to bring up because it just shows the difficulty and the divisiveness right now, not just between Democrats and Republicans, but there is a split within the Democratic Party and within the Republican Party. And what politicians are trying to do, particularly in this midterm, where it really does matter with these swing states, where each, part, each party is trying to convince independents and members of the other party to vote for them, there's a lot of trying to figure out exactly how to thread this needle. How do you appeal to your core base support supporters while also appealing to your independents and your moderates. And it leads to things like that dissonance and Biden calling himself a great unifier and then calling Republicans semi-fascists. It's, it's an awkward balance that he really is trying to strike right now. And I think there are a lot of questions remaining on how well that's actually going to work for him to be pushing those two messages at the same time. Emily, thank you. And very well framed, very diplomatic. Emily yeah. Wilkins there down in Washington, well, D.C. You wondered, Tom, whether the current president, this president, Joe Biden, addresses some of these things later this week. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the speech, John. It's gonna, there's sort of a mystery to it, I'd say, and sure. maybe it's because it's, it's August. John, I've got to ask you, with all the focus in your United Kingdom of the Tories, a conservative party, I'm sort of thunderstruck as I, from a distance, look at the Labour Party. How are they doing? In terms of the polls, Tom? Well, it's, it's Keir Starmer, right? Better, better in terms of better, the polls over the last right? year given the troubles that Boris Johnson got into, you'll see if Liz Truss will turn that around. I think the first job for Liz Truss is never mind an election and the polls. They've got to do something about offsetting the energy situation, Tom. And it's so different. As the current president said, we must be a president for all Americans. Whoever leads the Conservative Party has got to be a leader <clears throat> for everyone in the UK facing some tough times ahead. Interesting. This is Bloomberg. Very Turn the last couple of days upside down seems to be the theme right now, both in equities and the bond market as well. Equities positive, up three quarters of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up a little more than one full percentage point. Talked about the last couple of days, the two previous days, down by about 4% on the S&P, down by 5% on the Nasdaq. So a bounce back. Are you bullish here? If you are, this is the message from Sebastian Page to T. Rowe Price on this program 30 minutes ago. You are fighting the Fed if you're bullish. That seems to be the theme this morning with Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed catching up with Tracy Alloway and Joe Weisenthal and essentially saying he wasn't excited with a market reaction after the last Fed meeting and he was happy with some of the reaction that we've seen since Jackson Hole. I'll let you fill in the gaps there. There aren't many gaps to fill. In the bond market, 2's, 10's and 30 shaping up as follows. I said yesterday we came very close to the closing high of the year of about 342.67, just short of that level of the close yesterday on a two-year. Intraday, though, 348. 348 and back and away. Back to 340 now, down two basis points, the 3.4028%. That's the US, the bond market, the Treasury market, head of the Fed in September, 50 or 75. You take your pick. I never thought we'd be stood here saying this, that for the ECB, it's 50 or 75, and you take your pick. It's usually about the Federal Reserve over the last couple of months, but all of a sudden, that's on a table for the ECB. Euro dollar right now, Tom, 10026. Yeah. Bit of a stronger euro in the mix, positive a third of 1%. Mm. Spanish CPI fading just a right. little bit. We we'll see how punchy German CPI is in about 29 minutes. Very quickly here, John, I, I, I looked at the European Union Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which is really good math, and I didn't realize we're almost back to the COVID stress of February of 2020, I believe it was. It is, it is the deterioration of it, and the speed of deterioration is just shocking. The better news, though, for the ECB, Tom, is just the spread between Germany and Italy in and around yeah, 230 I basis points yesterday, even mm -hmm. with yields really pushing higher. So yeah. we'll see. You've got to look at both things, haven't you? I, I, in isolation, Italian yields are much higher. More recently, German yields are much higher. But the spread between the two mm -hmm. has been fairly contained for now, for now at least. Yeah, John, I looked at that last night as I considered the hotel just up from Lake Como 
you know, just up Villa the shore from Georgia's. In, in Chernobyl. No, it's so. north. There's a new hotel no. just above Villa de Deste. Which, which one's that? I can't pronounce okay. it. Okay. You know, I can't well, you, afford you it. You tell us where we're going it. and we'll figure out if we can make that yeah, trip. I talked to George about it. That trip seems a little bit more interesting for Lisa and I than maybe the other trip you were suggested about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> I was about to say. I'd maybe rather, better than going to China. I'd rather go to Italy in the lakes than quarantining in China. Okay. I think that's an easier sound for me and Lisa. Futures, Lisa, positive about eight oh, no, cents. Is it the Twitter report? I think bramma has got the Twitter report. I've got the Thank Twitter you. report. I've got the Bed Bath & Beyond report. I'm getting kind of sick of talking about Bed Bath & Beyond, frankly, but they just reported earnings. Their shares up more than 11%. I'm sick of talking about it because the shares are up uh, close to 200% this month, or they're coming in on that, even though they have been bouncing all over the place and face a strategic review later today, which we will get. HP Inc., as well as Chewy, also reporting later today. Those shares up just marginally. HP, I'm actually interested to see what the hardware demand is like from individuals, especially with some of the personal computer purchases, uh, really tapering off, as well as from businesses. Are they investing in offices to bring people back now that perhaps the working from home aspects are getting a little bit old? If you take a look at Twitter, let's give you the Twitter report. Basically, the new excuse that Elon Musk has for why he's going to ex uh, exit stage left for this $44 billion bid for the company is because of the whistleblower who has called out uh, one of the chief uh, members of the executive committee in Twitter. What was fired, was calling out Twitter for some of its security practices. Those shares lower uh, by nearly nine tenths of a percent, but just the level is really notable $39.69 versus $54.20. $54.20. That was the initial price. How much damage has been done to this company? BMO coming out, actually missing expectations, softer than expected results on investment banking. And this, I expect to be a theme when we get some of the uh, investment bank reports coming up in a couple of weeks here. How much has that really? removed some of the profits simply because the capital markets have been so slow. And then we still do have a little bit of optimism, at least in the crypto uh, space. Uh, we have a 3.3% gain. Yeah, Marathon Digital uh, gaining. Tom, the reason why it's interesting to me, and it actually is, is because <laughs> this is, and you guys both are laughing, so you're like, how are you going to justify well, no, why just, you, you put this you up? You never talk about it. So I never talk about crypto. The stage crypto. is yours. The stage is yours. Okay. I will say that it is interesting in terms of the appetite for the riskiest aspects of the market. How much do people bet on this sort of resurgence in those areas that were really boosted by free money? And with the free money taken out, what remains? And I think that that's going to be fascinating. And how much strategic risk is there if a lot of the stuff does not remain, Tom? So is that the Bramo crypto report, John? That, that's it. That's what happens when Bitcoin breaks 20K. I mean, Lisa steps on. up and gets interested. <laughs> I, I, you know, like, Marathon Digital's moving. Not else is like, pe things aren't moving that much, which is interesting in and of itself. It's August, Tom. I think you put up a banner that said that a little it's bit August, ago. It's August, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah, all, here we go. Lisa, Bramo, thank you. Anytime. Thanks thank for, uh, <laughs> for saving me. Kathy He's like, thank Jones you. Kathy Jones just about walked <laughs> off the camera. Joining us now from Charles Schwab, the chief uh, fixed income strategist, Kathy Jones. Kathy, where do bonds fit in a portfolio? Help me here. It's August. I'm reframing for the Q4. I'm reframing for ownership of fixed income into 2023, and I'm sorry, I'm lost. How, wh where does it fit into a portfolio? Yeah, Tom. I, you know, obviously it, it's been a very tough year, and there's been a lot of questions about whether bonds can deliver that diversification benefit that they have for so many years. But I would argue this: that you still get capital preservation. And now you're actually getting income in fixed income. So I think there's still a valid reason to have fixed income. Obviously, you need to be pretty strategic about the amount that you have and the type that you have. We like having higher credit quality. And um, we're moving out in duration as, as yields move up so that we can capture some of that income screen longer term. Kathy, what does credit fit in, given the difficulties we could face later this year? Yeah, we're very cautious on credit, particularly high yield. Um, you know, the spreads moved up, then they came down, it's starting to move up again, but we just don't think high yield is priced to deliver uh, the kinds of returns we'd like to see in a slowing economy and potential recession uh, scenario. So I'd be pretty careful on high yield. Uh, investment grade, you know, we think is okay. We wouldn't take a huge amount of duration risk, but some of the bigger companies with solid balance sheets uh, should be able to deliver. And you can get decent income in investment grade corporates right now. And locking some of that in and even a five year duration uh, is going to give you north of 4%, which is, which is not bad 
for an income investor. When you look internationally, Kathy, and you look at some of the projections for the ECB raising rates, possibly by 75 basis points uh, next month, how much does that change your outlook more broadly, considering the regime that we've seen and considering uh, how much pain we have seen uh, transpire in the Euro project? Yeah, it, you know, our firmest conviction this year is that the yield curve will will invert and uh, that inversion will deepen. And the harder the central banks go in that direction in terms of raising rates to crush inflation, the more likely we are to see that inversion continue. So it doesn't really change the scenario. It actually, I guess, reinforces the idea that um, if the ECB tightens aggressively into a very weak economy on top of the Fed and all the other central banks, it's really hard to see that we avoid some sort of global recession. And that should mean you know, more and more inversion in yield curve. So, and that means also the reason why you're more enthusiastic about duration. What does that mean in terms of the likelihood of the credit declines that you expect, not only in the U.S., but also in Europe? I mean, you're talking about being very cautious on high yield. What's the magnitude of the potential losses that you see versus just simply strategically being away from them as you wait for this to play out? Yeah, it's more of a strategic decision. Um, obviously, triple C's, you know, the very lowest credit quality, uh, we're always a little bit cautious on that, but particularly that's a pro-cyclical position, and this is not the time to be in the lowest credit quality. So we think, it, you know, you could see uh, spreads widen 150 basis points or so in the high yield area, and there's just not a lot of uh, potential reward for the risk that you're taking in that uh, that area. Now, investment grade looks a little bit stronger. You know, a lot of these companies have turned out their debt over the long term. So we don't see quite as much risk there, but it's, right. you know, definitely credit is, is pro-cyclical and this is not the time to be overweighting credit. Yeah, I, I, well, I think I agree with that. When I look at the charts, Kathy, I just looked at a, a vanilla corporate piece, a quality name everybody knows. And I'm sorry, it's had an ugly August. And I look at the Bloomberg total return index. It's now down 14, even 15 percent from the peak. But what concerns me, Kathy, is in the last week, it's rolled over again to lower price, higher yield. What are the ramifications if that index breaks through the, let me get the date, John, if it breaks through the June low? I mean, I mean, it's stunning. Yeah, you know, I think what we're reflecting here is this combination of fear of Fed rate hikes and deteriorating economic growth. <clears throat> So if we, we break that low, I don't know that there's a, a huge significance to it. I don't think that we're going to see huge amounts of flows in and out based on, you know, levels anymore. Um, anybody who wanted to exit fixed income or the credit market has probably done so already at this stage of the game and moved to very short-term treasuries. Uh, but, you know, it, it continues to wear on this, uh, the total return in portfolios overall. You know, you're not making money in stock, you're not making money in bonds. And, uh, and I think that people just will tend to want to be in safer and safer assets if we continue to see deterioration. Kathy Jones, Kathy, love catching up with you. Miss the piano. Miss the piano. I really do. Do you see Lizzie Burden yesterday, Tom, with a piano behind her? Yeah. I told her the surveillance rules that if you turn up with a piano, you got to play Thank it. You. Yeah. She said it wasn't in tune. Yeah, well, yeah. that's a good... A good catch. <laughs> when a good I play, yeah, exactly. John, when Kathy, I play the you. piano in tune, it sounds like it's not in tune. John, this drives me nuts. I'm going to get up in the pulpit right now, the surveillance pulpit. Sure. Bond people don't know how to justify losses. They're so out of practice on that over 20 years of a total return bull market. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the Bloomberg Total Re Return Index, and it's three years minimum catch-up and it's rolling over to new lows. Is that your morning rant? That's my. I just don't get it why bond people can't say bonds suck, get out of it. Stay tuned for my morning rant on rents. Coming up next, I have you seen the West rental Ham. prices? Yeah. Have you seen the rental prices? 4,200 in, in New York I was City. thunderstruck. I looked yesterday for Brutal. the first time in ages. Absolutely Stunning. unbelievable. We're going to hit that next. Stunning. From New York. Stunning, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the best word, I'm Rishika Gupta. U.S. says that a controlled shutdown 
of the Ukrainian nuclear power plant seized by the Russians would be the safest option. Artillery shells continue to land near the plant. Meanwhile, International Atomic Energy Agency monitors will assess the damage and account for nuclear material at the reactor. President Biden will deliver a primetime speech Thursday slamming Republicans for what he sees as their threats to U.S. rights and freedoms. According to a White House official, the president will speak about the continued, quote, battle for the soul of the nation. He's trying to boost Democrats' chances in the November elections. And China is battling COVID in every province despite its use of the world's strictest measures to keep the virus out. All 31 mainland provinces recorded at least one local COVID case over the past 10 days. That's the broadest measure to the virus since early 2021. Restrictions have been increasing around Beijing and in Shenzhen, China's southern technology hub. And Best Buy posted quarterly profit that beat Wall Street estimates. A month ago, the consumer electronics chain warned that it was under pressure from slumping demand. Consumers are shifting more spending to travel and other services. That's after they binged on TVs, computers and appliances during the first two years of the pandemic. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think we've already turned the corner on the economy in a negative way. We're seeing things roll over. And I'm willing to bet that by December, we're complaining about deflation and real problems in the economy rather than inflation. I think we've gone too far too quickly. Peter Chair of Academy Securities there weighing in on this economy. And he thinks yeah. that things are turning around and turning around in the wrong direction quickly. Here's the rent on rents. Here's the data. Martin Paris of Bloomberg put this one together. Look at this. 1486 is the median national one-bedroom rent for a newly listed yeah. one-bedroom up almost 12% over August 21. More than half of US cities are showing double-digit rent hikes, with some over 30%. Martin also pointing out what's happening here in New York City. The median one-bedroom rent is up almost 40% year over year. Those with two-bedroom apartments are paying 46.7% more. The Manhattan rent now, Tom, monthly rent has climbed to... 4212 dollars $4, up over 27 percent over the last year there's a massive unreal mal yeah there's a male distribution here john because it's not you know a gaussian curve of fancy people out here and really destitute people there it's hugely skewed to boring mundane one and two bedroom rundown apartments and it's shocking what they're asking for those we're all moving to staten island Tom. Medium no, I one don't bedroom think it's rent. A joke. Where are we moving? Seriously. 5%. Where's the nation moving? I mean, TK, where is I don't the know. I mean, it wasn't even joking. Nation. I mean, given to some of the price action we've seen. And TK, you and I have talked about this. A lot of people, I'm one of them, locked in with a very low pandemic rate, staring down the barrel of a 40%, 50% increase. Pretty I, tough stuff, I'll Tom. There. Thanks to Lizanne Saunders for retweeting out that story. Uh, just a remarkable. I've got a, you know, Miami, $2,500. Miami used to be a giveaway. So much for that. Right now on Foreign Exchange, Shab Jalanus joins us, Chief Foreign Exchange Rate Strategist at Credit Suisse. I want to go to yen before we look at some of the other currencies. I've been waiting for a yen breakout to weaker yen. I got it yesterday, 136, 137, almost up to a 139 level. Just a quick brief on the dynamics of yen and why it matters for American and Western listeners and viewers. So the key reason the yen is so weak is the big discrepancy that's now in existence between where Japanese monetary policy is and where basically right. everyone else's is. Um, and what we saw at Jackson Hole that was interesting from BOJ Governor Kuroda was a recommitment to keeping Japanese monetary policy easy for a long time to come. Um, and that's quite different to what we're seeing in other places. For example, even at the ECB, there's now talk of potentially a 75 basis point hike next week. So uh, this is the underlying dynamic. It's been in play for a long time. Um, but it's not going away. So it, we could see dollar yen easily take out 140. Well, that's where I wanted to go. Is it a big figure play? Is it a seismic change? Most of our viewers and listeners can't even frame out 140, 150, yeah. whatever. But is it kind of, is it a five figure move? I think we could go to the mid 140s pretty quickly um, wow. once we get to. What's that mean for China? 
Well, that's the other interesting element here. So ch uh, Chinese renminbi now is pushing on the 690 level uh, against the dollar. Uh, it's obviously not entirely driven by what the yen does. There's local factors too. Mm -hmm. But I think the Chinese do have one eye on the yen. And we saw the Koreans as well uh, at Jackson Hole, the Bank of Korea the governor, directly mention the impact on the yen on their monetary policy, on their currency. So I feel that all of East Asia is linked to some extent to what the yen is doing, uh, at least from, a, from an FX perspective right. uh, and an FX market perspective. That's going to stay the way of things going forward as well. And the flip side of this is that, you know, this is sort of an idiosyncratic move as a result to an extraordinary policy, and the rest of the world is not partaking in it, particularly Europe. And I'm wondering, considering the fact that we're seeing some stability and finally a, a retracement above par, uh, above parity, I should say, for the euro, do you expect that to continue as there is a more cohesive effort to really address some of the energy problems? I think that's right. Uh, what we saw at Jackson Hole when it comes to the euro, comments from some ECB members about the valuation of the euro actually making a difference, actually mattering. Again, that's quite different to what we've seen uh, out of Japan. Uh, we're now seeing attempts to raise supplies of gas in storage that seem to be working at this point. And now, as you say, there's even an attempt to try to address the uh, energy price story in, in a more direct manner. Now, whether these things work or not in the medium term is a different issue. But right now, it gives the market some reasons to hope that at least the euro has the potential to find some kind of uh, stability at this point, given these factors. Throw in a potential 75 basis point ECB hike as well, and you have enough reasons for the market to at least do some short covering in the euro after a long period when it looked like uh, it was a very easy trade to keep selling it below parity. Is a uh, one uh, euro to dollar is basically parity pricing in a 75 basis point rate hike by the ECB? It's, it's certainly at least pricing in half a, a well, 50% chance of a 75 basis point rate hike, I would say, at this point. Um, so that's you know, where the market is. And I think if we actually get the 75 basis point hike, I would imagine the euro could push higher above parity, uh, particularly if the market buys it in as much as if the market believes that this is a, a sustainable new policy from the ECB, as opposed to simply trying to fade it by bringing down longer term rates then I think the euro could, could find a bit of a base around parity. But we do need to see that 75 basis point rate hike. If, if it doesn't come, I think we will again go back below parity. In Shahab, can I ask you the question that Lisa and, asked, uh, <coughs> and I have asked all year, which essentially is, if we do get an upside surprise on rate hikes, how much conviction do you actually have that it leads to a stronger currency? You mentioned that it might. Is that a strongly convicted call, or are you still on the fence about that? I think it's a base case minimum for the currency to not go down. That's, that's the way I see it. So uh, even if it rallies on the back of a 75 basis point hike, I think once the data comes through from Europe showing uh, the, the very high recession risks that we anticipate there, uh, the euro will, will struggle to keep going up. So I think eventually the downward pressures will resume. But I think it, it's certainly helpful to have that narrative out there because I think if it wasn't out there, we'd already be substantially below parity even right, right now. John, I'm, I'm doing some fancy math here. A log, ex, a log regression of the weakening of yen, two standard deviations is a 147.80. That's unimaginable. Well, it How was, a, it was unimaginable, Tom. And things and that's have changed. stunning. Things have changed so to much. To Shahab's point of you know, 145. Dolly M right now, stunning. 138. Shahab, great to wow. catch up. Shahab Jananous at Credit Suisse. <clears throat> Lisa, looking forward to not the BOJ, but the ECB. September 8th. Yeah, how much can they really get ahead of what we've seen in terms of the weakening to, of the euro? And how much is what we've seen in terms of a retracement above parity, not the prospect of a 75 basis point rate hike, but some sort of agreement on how to bring energy prices lower, right? Which is it? Great lineup in the next 30 minutes. That I can tell you, Lisa. <laughs> Jeff, you. <laughs> You're like, FBNY I'm not going to respond to that. I've got no answer for it. <laughs> I know, I hear Why you. Why would I pretend? Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon. I pretend on a lot of other things, I know. <laughs> He's going to join us in about five minutes' time. And then it's on to David Rosenberg a little bit later this morning at about 8.30 Eastern time. I know Tom's excited for that one, as we all are. Looking at equity futures up six or seven tenths of one percent. The bounce fades just a little bit there on the NASDAQ 100, up nine tenths of one percent. Fades just a little bit there. And the retracement of yields, that fades a little bit too. We're down three or four basis points on a 10-year, the 3.0652 percent. Euro dollar in at around parity. First. You want to call it a snooze fest, Tom? Up a quarter of 1%. I, I think Europe is the last place you'd fall asleep right now. Yeah, that's there true. is so much yeah, going on as we get you all war. prepared the for the ECB meeting next week on September 
8th from New York City, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. I think the Fed is committed to bring inflation down. They want to make sure that they can strangle inflation. The Fed's expecting this very soft landing. We think that that's going to be very hard for them to achieve. I think we've already turned the corner on the economy in a negative way. We're seeing things roll over. I still think we could get a you know late rally in the fourth quarter. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramas, and Tom Keen. It is August, and we're going to give you, in this hour, Jeffrey Yu and David Rosenberg. John, I refuse to say it's an August quiet. There's a lot going on towards that ECB meeting in September. I refuse to say it. I think you've said it about 10 times, Tom, this August already. I think for the Federal Reserve, the takeaway for a lot of people, Tom, and the takeaway for Sebastian Page T. Rowe Price, I thought this was the headline of this morning. You're fighting the Fed if you're bullish. You right. are fighting the Fed. If you're bullish this market, that's the message from him about an hour ago. And are you fighting the Hungarian Central Bank? This has global ramifications, John. They go up to near 12 percent on their rate. I mean, there, there's a global sense to it. It was reaffirmed today by Nathan Sheets at Citigroup talking about global recession. A Danske Bank looking for 75 basis points from the ECB next week, Tom. 75 basis points into potentially a recession, probably a recession. I'm waiting for the German inflation numbers right now after the Spanish inflation numbers came in. Just a little bit lighter, TK, going into Eurozone CPI tomorrow morning. And the CPI, of course, will be speaking with David Rosenberg as the partition of the CPI. John, which part it gets your attention? Shouter, without a doubt. Yep. TK, without a doubt. Totally agree. If we're talking about the United States, if we're talking about Europe, we're talking about energy and gas prices, TK, through the roof. Well, the energy in, in Europe is there. Lisa, I want to go over to shelter. John mentioned the real estate and the rent here with New York City uh, leading the way. To me, it's discreet, Lisa, and separate from the Fed inflation debate. Is it, though? I mean, honestly, this is this is a good question, especially because what the Fed is doing right now is putting a ceiling on how high pr housing prices can, can apparently go. And we're going to be getting a slew of housing data today, as well as tomorrow and through the rest of the week. But it's not trickling into rents quickly enough. And this goes to the whole discussion, Tom, of how well, long does it take for the transmission mechanism of higher rates into lower prices and some of the basic goods that people uh, need to pay for? Let's get through the data so we get the Jeff you, John. I think that's important. Brent crude 101. John, West Texas 94 down almost $3. Euro dollar a little north of parity at 10029. We're positive on that currency pair by a third of 1%. German CPI month on month 0.4% in line with the estimate. Year over year 8.8%. .8%, up yeah. from 85 in line with the estimate of 8.8, .8, and it's teeing up Eurozone CPI tomorrow and an ECB decision next week. The ECB next week, Tom, we've got September 13th in the diary, so a couple of weeks away, for CPI in America, September 2nd for payroll, wow. so that's this Friday, and then September 21 for the big Fed decision, just around the corner. 30 seconds here, John. You've been waiting for this this morning. Socially, 8.8% inflation in Germany is unacceptable. Yeah, I'd say that's about 7% too much. Seven percentage points I, I, too high. Honestly, in all my history of uh, reading this, that's uh, more than anything, that's the biggest shock. It's on you and I together have covered Europe for the best part of a decade. To see it at this kind of level, yeah. if I'd said this to you 10 years ago, I think you would have laughed me out of the room. Yeah, well, and, I and did. We but... are. For, for other reasons. <laughs> for other reasons. Well, let's continue here now. Futures up uh, 29. The VIX, I'm watching 25. Point three three. David Rosenberg to join us later. And now Jeffrey Yu joins us, senior EMA market strategist at BNY Mellon. It is a jumble in August, Jeffrey Yu. If you were having the next cup of coffee with Jerome Powell, what would you say he needs to watch globally for September? Globally for September, look at what your peers are doing. Are they going to follow you and say not only are rates going to go up, but they're going to go up for a sustained period? Europe is next. What are the BOEs going to do for so much, for, for such a while? market's been pricing in a quick, aggressive move by the BOE and then cuts towards the end of 23 or maybe early 24. Is that going to happen now? Because if Europe is now looking at sustained high rates for some time, uh, then that's going to constrain global growth. And then you just ask, where is the growth going to come from? Jeff, on your tour, meeting clients, do you meet any bulls? 
because we're struggling no. to find them. No, well, I am in Europe, you know, right now. So within Europe, uh, until there is a plan to deal with the energy situation, it sounds like behind the scenes, you no know, plans are being formulated. Uh, then we'll just go and revisit, you know, once we see what the plans are. But then again, you know, being the UK where, um, you know, let's just say there is a bit of a vacuum, you know, at the very top right now, we're waiting for plans. It's really hard to know, you know, what the outlook is, you know, when there is just no plan. At some point, things get better and they come in better than expected, Jeff. Do you think the market is positioned for that kind of story? Have we seen that wash out in any way, shape or form from, from your perspective? Well, I always go back to positioning, you know, just looking at how markets have their asset allocation right now in terms of risk assets. So you're still relatively overweight U.S. assets. You're still overweight the dollar. So there's only one direction though, to go. You want to wait for that trigger. So if I want to construct a positive narrative, you know, maybe China is you know, not right now. We probably you know, could use a bit of uh, a bit more disinflation from China. But heading into next year, just as the world you know, needs a bit of a growth kick, that external demand may come from China's normalization story. So that's something I'm holding out for maybe six months or further down the line. Uh, but at this point, best to stay conservative. Go back to positioning. Where positioning is lightest in risk, where you're going to see the brace of positivity. Jeff, another way of asking what John was getting at is, have we priced in fully a recession in Europe, a downturn that flirts with recession, or is one in the United States, and a sub-3% GDP handle on Chinese growth? Have we already priced that in to global markets? So we've certainly priced in recession in Europe, just looking at how the euro is treading water around parity right now. 3%, you know, China... Uh, so it really depends on which day, because if I look at you know, how Chinese equities are performing, especially in the tech space, I think markets are actually looking for positivity, looking for um, some relief on the regulatory side, you know, looking for perhaps down the line some normalization uh, in societal restrictions as well. So actually uh, in China, 3% may be headline growth investment driven, but the Chinese consumer, the household, probably not as bad. And US certainly not a recession yet, as long as the labor market's in rude health. But let's see after Friday, uh, maybe that could change as well. So, Jeff, if that's the case, what would you have to see to not be quite as bearish, right, to not be quite as conservative if the positioning right now is pretty gloomy? Uh, so to not be bearish, I think we see a peaking in inflation numbers because you know, that then you know that the household's starting to show some restraint. And then on top of that, um, as Chen Powell has already said, and probably global central banks, they're going to keep rates high probably for a little longer than expected. But then you have that dual problem right. approach whereby growth is going to come off. So right. you need to be light at the end of the tunnel for inflation expectations. That's the bottom line. Jeff, you, you and I were trained that in finance, four standard deviations is a substantial move. And we learned that in medicine, six standard deviations is maybe equivalent because of the resiliency of the human body. German inflation is reported moments ago off the long-term trend is a really elegant study of nine standard deviations. We have never seen this. How do we extricate ourselves from a nine standard deviation move? Well, let me tell you how our data is showing the euro is trying to position itself for that. We are at three and a half times usual level of euro holdings short. Within our positioning days, especially for the majors, anything beyond one and a half times short or long, then I sit up and take notice. Euro is at three and a half already. So do you chase that or do you fade it? You know, so near right now it's like heart says fade it, you know, but head said you probably, well, you don't want to chase it, but you certainly don't want to gain, go against that right now. So the market is pushing this. They want to see how low things can get before we get a policy reaction and more importantly, a plan, you know, from the European Commission, from the energy minister, from the energy ministers. Um, but uh, going back to your stand, nine standard deviation movement, markets are really close by euro standards to enforcing that case. Jeff, some of these numbers, this from Goldman this morning, just reading this note, that inflation could top 22% next year in the UK if natural gas prices remain elevated in the coming months. So City last week at 18%. That would be the peak for UK CPI for them. Bank of England's got it at 13 Jeff, can you get your head around that kind of number in the UK, 22%? Well, it really is going to be a struggle um, for the BOE to you know, try to communicate that. And to be frank, you know, looking at the consumption data in the UK right now, uh, we aren't exactly you know, seeing that retrenchment you know, in spending. So it looks right. like the household is actually doing OK. So is there a gap between reality and uh, what's going on, on the ground? So we need to see some convergence at this point. Until we get that convergence, you know, we will be painful. Then, I'm sorry, the central bank message is going to be very, very fierce. You know, hold back right, right now. 
situation is going to get out of control. Jeff, you just sterling trade weighted reached the John Major weaknesses of 1992. Uh, so I'm um, very um, uh, lost to um, try to make those comparisons because there was a de-pegging involved you know, at yeah. that point. But put it this way, right, if they want to you know, limit the fallout you know, from um, an exchange rate and a collapse, and then we need a plan you know, right now that could come as early as next week, right, to match the euro at least to save the household, especially on the lower income side. That is absolutely necessary at this point. The market's anticipating that if the new government comes short, you know, then... I think comparisons with 1992 are going to be drawn. So let's well, revisit time. Jeff Yu, thank you, sir, FB and Y Mellon. Uh, thanks to David Goodman here at Bloomberg for writing this story up off the back of the Goldman note. Yeah. This Goldman note is all centred around whether gas prices in the UK stay at these levels. Ultimately, if they do, this is the call. The UK will be forced to increase its energy cap by a further 80% in January, that would push up inflation to 22.4% and trigger a 3.4% decline in GDP. Tom, that's one hell of a call from Goldman Sachs. It, it is, and the backdrop here, not to get into it in detail, is there's two fronts to the Ukrainian war today. And I mean, there's great activity here into the end of August, almost back two, three, four centuries where you're racing through the summer, John, to prosecute the effort. You wonder where the war news will dovetail with the financial news in six weeks. The big if here, Elisa, and it's worth highlighting, is what happens with gas. Yeah. That's the big if here. Especially as the coalition of European members work together to try to lower those prices. Futures right now up seven tenths of 1% on a beautiful morning here in New York City. Good morning, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rutika Gupta. It would be the largest transfer of U.S. weapons to Taiwan in almost two years, Bloomberg's learned. The Biden administration is preparing to sell $1.1 billion in missiles and radar support. The sale doesn't offer Taiwan any new military capacity. Still, it's likely to lead to more protests from China. Meanwhile, Taiwan's China Airlines has ordered 16 Boeing 787 Dreamliners in a deal valued at $2.1 billion. The airline also has options for eight more of the planes. Deliveries are set to begin in 2025. The Boeing jets will replace China's airline's aging Airbus A330 fleet. In Europe, energy prices plunged as the EU prepares to intervene in the market. German power for next year fell as much as 26%. Dutch natural gas was down 11%. The EU is trying to prevent the energy crisis from spiraling out of control by lowering power costs. It's also trying to break the link between gas and electricity costs. Ukraine has launched an offensive along the southern front of its war with Russia. The Ukrainian military says its artillery hit Russian positions around the Kherson region. Kherson is a river port that was one of the first cities to fall to Russian troops. And billionaire Elon Musk has sent a letter to Twitter adding reasons why he wants to terminate his takeover agreement. Musk says that Twitter may have breached their deal in five more ways. The letter was sent after a whistleblower alleged that the company didn't know or care to find out how many of its users were spam or robot accounts. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We think it's good that the Fed is doing what it's doing. It's on the case. It's going after inflation. It's going. It recognizes it's going to take longer, as we look at it today, uh, for the Fed to to put inflation in check. But the main thing is they're doing it. John Stelfus, there, the chief investment strategist at Oppenheimer Asset Management. We found you a bull. We found you a bull. I was going to say the same That's thing. like the one bull we've managed to find <laughs> because we keep asking people whether they have also found bulls and they keep telling us they haven't. We got a bounce this morning. Good morning to you. Live from New York on TV and radio alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. On Bloomberg Surveillance, we are higher by seven tenths of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100. Yeah. We're up by almost one full percentage point. We're hearing from the Richmond Fed president, Mr. Barkin. He's saying the following, the Fed will do what it takes to return inflation to 2 does not expect inflation to come down 
Thoughts? Immediately. Oh. John Van Van over at BlackRock, Tom, has asked an important question. He would like to see the Fed attack this question just a little bit more. Do we need to rethink the appropriate time horizon to return inflation back to target? given some of the challenges well, that we're facing right now. Let's be honest. Mr. Bovin studying in Princeton under a guy named Bernanke, his first class of Future Bank of Canada, uh, had. And, John, that's the arch issue that we addressed at Jackson Hole. If you're going to go to 2 percent, the foreverness of it may be tangible. I thought Adam Posen was brilliant on that. Well, Adam Posen thinks at some point we should accept, Tom, Three. our inflation target. Yeah. Yeah, well, that it's was just a, too early to even well, entertain yeah. that, Lisa. Can I can I just bring this uh, another headline from Tom Barkin that the pace of when the Fed gets back to that two percent inflation is uncertain. So basically, not weighing in on exactly the question that you guys are talking yeah. as you ask it. So just wanted to bring is that to you. Yeah. In real time, he's live blogging Bloomberg surveillance. Exactly. That's what we expect from <laughs> Fed presidents. Of course. We want them to live blog the market. <laughs> we want them to live blog the show. Is that forward guidance? What he's doing? No, there's nothing forward about it. He's saying it's uncertain. We have no clue. It's giving nothing, which uh, perhaps is forward guidance in itself. Maybe, maybe Kashkari was forward uh, guidance. Let's move on right now to Megan Horneman, David Rosenberg coming up. Ms. Horneman is chief investment officer at Verdant's Capital Advisors and joins us. To the conversation we just had, Megan, are you a bull? Um, I, longer term, I'm a bull. I think in the next three to four months through the rest of this year, it's going to be a, a really volatile time. Um, we're coming into a seasonally a seasonal period with September that tends to be very weak. We've got a lot of uncertainty from, as mentioned before, what's going on with the European gas markets, um, the Federal Reserve, and we also have the midterm elections coming up. So I think in the near term, yeah. we expect some choppy well, sessions. Well, what's interesting here, you know, with your time at Deutsche Bank and Leg Mason, where you have to call the SPX or you have to call the now, whatever the NASDAQ at Verdant's, it's about portfolios. What are you actually doing given a strategy within a portfolio? Is it focused, less diversified, or is it spread it all out, or does it just go to cash? Well, it's always to be diversified. Um, there, we do have uh, a little bit of extra dry powder in the accounts right now. That is necessary, but it's also it's about diversification. So, what we've been doing this year, just from a portfolio standpoint, is looking at areas of the market that have basically, you know priced in that peak pessimism. So we want to look longer term. We're not going to look over the next three to four months with this volatile market. Instead, we'll look at this volatile market as potential opportunities for our accounts looking a little bit longer term, the next 18, 24 months. Where do we think we'll be? Where is the value? Has the housing market priced in peak pessimism? Um, I think there's a, a lot more room to go with the housing market, unfortunately, because with interest rates where they are, um, with consumers starting to pull back, I don't think the housing market is really in for a very good you know, remainder of this year. I think there's going to be some more correction there, um, not necessarily a bubble bursting, but we do need a housing correction here um, in the near term. So what kind of housing correction are we look at, looking at, and at what point will it lower the rents for the likes of John Farrow, who might be looking for another apartment? <laughs> I think you've got a little bit room to go. Um, we just started to see some deterioration in this housing and for in this housing data. And what we saw recently was you need to see that inventory build up. And we're starting to see it from the new home sales perspective, existing home sales. Once that inventory build up really starts to increase, then you could see some some uh, I guess some moderation there in that rents. Megan, where do bonds fit in at Verdens? Uh, we're really defensive with the bond market. Uh, we, we stay very short duration. We don't have a lot of credit exposure. In fact, I'd be very concerned about credit exposure right now, given what the Fed's going to start doing in September by aggressively you know, reducing that balance sheet. So I think you, you should be very defensive, short-term floating rate instruments. Um, be careful of investment-grade bonds. Be underweight, high yield at this point as well, and any kind of structured credit as well. Megan, thank you. You're not alone on that one, that's for sure. Megan Horneman there at Vernon's Capital Advisors. Lisa, too early to look ahead to payrolls? I don't think it's too early no, to look ahead to payrolls. No. 300K is the estimate right now, down from a previous number of 528. In that nice little montage of us pushing ahead from voting payrolls five minutes ago or so. Lisa, you talked about the good news, bad news, bad news, good news. Is bad news just bad news? this Friday, given what the Fed is telling us? Yeah, that basically, it, well, you know, if you get bad news, if you get a weaker than expected number, people might see a 50 basis point rate hike as getting locked in, right? Not a 75 basis point rate hike at the September meeting. And then what does the market do on that is another question, right? Does the market rally? And that's where bad news could become good news, which is head spinning and exhausting. And that's where I think we are in this market. And right then ultimately now. the Fed pushes back because 
this is what they want to see. Right, exactly. I mean, I, 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 I actually, I'm going to push back against payrolls being an important number. I think it sure. is an important number, but I think CPI is going to be more important and more instructive when it comes to whether they hike 50 or 75 basis Upside points. Upside surprise or downside surprise, it'll be 50 or 75. And basically, that's what Bostick of Atlanta told us on Friday, almost verbatim, he said that. I want to go back to the comments of Diane Swank, though. Just yesterday and on Twitter, the amount the Fed raises in September is less important than the direction and the resolve to slow economic growth below potential and raise unemployment. Lisa's been on top of this, Tom. What's going to happen when unemployment starts climbing? Can we just keep asking that question? How are people going to respond to that if this Fed keeps saying we're going to hike? And they're setting us up for that. They're telling us that is their reaction function. That is the goal, the objective. When unemployment starts climbing... Even if that's the case, we've got work to do. Let's get CPI there's lower. An overestimation of the simplicity of these functions, these reaction functions. And the answer is, John, I think they're far more complex than simple analysis. And with the, if the unemployment rate goes up, there's the haves, have nots debate and all that. There's any number of conditions that can get you to 4% or other conditions that can get you to 5% unemployment. We need a different perspective, and we've got the perfect guest for that up next. David Rosenberg, the founder and president of Rosenberg Research, is going to be joining us in around about five minutes' time. Looking forward to that. To get you up to speed on the price action, here's a snapshot. We fade just a little bit off session highs on the S&P, up six-tenths of 1%, moving higher by about 24 points. On the Nasdaq 100, up eight-tenths of 1% after a two-day rout. On the Nasdaq 100, raised about five percentage points off that index. In the bond market, yield to lower by a couple of basis points. The 10-year, 3.0801%. And Barkin of the Richmond Fed, recession is the risk in getting inflation under control. I think that captures the story perfectly. From New York, this is Bloomberg. from New York. Good morning to you. This morning on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures with a bounce up five or six tenths of one percent on the S&P. I have to say that bounce is fading fast, going into the open and balance about an hour away. The Nasdaq higher by, let's call it three quarters of one percent. Yields in just a couple of basis points now, down about two to 3.0782 percent on the US 10 year. A little bit later, Lisa guided you through the data to expect. I'll go through it again for you if you missed it. Some house price data out a little bit later this morning at nine Eastern. Then we get the consumer confidence numbers from the conference board at 10 o'clock. Jolt's job openings at 10 a.m. Eastern as well, Tom. We know that's become somehow an important figure uh, for all of us looking at this labour market, looking for that to back away to about 10.3 million, 10.4 million or so for the month of July. John, thanks. David Rosenberg joins now with Rosenberg Research. He is the best in the world at parsing inflation. I will not mince words about it. David, on the Bloomberg, I can look at CPI inflation back to World War I, and the average over the many 110 years is 3.1%. Part of that are the spikes up, which are hugely stochastic and come down quickly. Will we disinflate rapidly? I think we will, Tom. And I think that you're already seeing it in a lot of uh, indicators. Uh, I'll mention three. Uh, commodity prices uh, are well off their highs, uh, even though Oil prices have hung in in the past couple of weeks. They're down more than 20% uh, from the peak. Base metal prices are down 25%. Um, you know, you've got lumber is down more like 70%. Uh, so the commodity complex, uh, which hasn't shown up yet, you know, in that 40% chunk of the CPI called goods, you know, the stuff that you can see, right. touch and feel, commodities are, are deflating. Uh, you've got freight costs across the board. I mean, look at the, the Baltic Dry Index. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And what, then, what, then what, I want to stop there, David. This got, is, David. The, the U.S. dollar is up 12% year over year. Does anybody in the world think that you've seen all the pass-through right. uh, from the strength in the dollar into goods prices? And the answer is no. This will all show up in the next 12 months. David, Lizanne Saunders featured Baltic Dry Index yesterday. Explain to our global audience the symbolism of the cratering of the Baltic Dry Index. Well, I think a lot of it is the byproduct of the fact that global demand is coming under downward pressure. Uh, I would also say that we are seeing, notwithstanding the ongoing war uh, in the Ukraine, which doesn't seem to make the front pages of the paper anymore, you are starting to see an unclogging in a lot of the port congestion 
uh, globally. And so you're seeing the supply side thaw out. You know, where you're seeing that most evidently, Tom, uh, is in the survey data on supply delivery delays, uh, which have come down dramatically across every single survey, Richmond Fed, Kansas City Fed, Philly Fed, New York Empire. And, you know, it's very interesting from a Fed perspective is that, you know, about five months ago, Jay Powell said that, you know, we're going to operate policy blindly uh, relative to what's happening on the supply side. Uh, the Fed made a decision five months ago that we're just going to concentrate on demand destruction uh, getting or getting demand growth below supply, which I think is a wise policy. But you see the supply side is finally taking hold and creating the disinflation before you've ever even seen any of the lagged impacts that the Fed has already done, you know, through rates and QT on the demand side. Uh, so you have the supply curve actually becoming more elastic at a time when the Fed is engaging in a policy that's going to really kill demand. So explain to me as we get the chalkboard out and you draw these demand supply curves, how does inflation not absolutely collapse in the next year? You know, I, I, say, I say this to my clients. They look at me like I'm crazy. Oh, we know uh, that. But, no, <laughs> not all of them do. Megan Swiber uh, over at uh, Bank of America would not look at you like you're crazy because she's still expecting rate cuts next year. And it's not because she doubts the reaction function from the Fed, but she also sees the prospect of inflation coming down very rapidly as we head into the second half of 2023. At what point, and this is really head spinning, does this become in some ways good news for the market because they can start to price in a softer touch or a softer approach from the Federal Reserve? Well, so what's going to happen at some point, and who knows when, with this Fed in particular? I mean, when Neil Kashkari becomes the biggest hawk on the FOMC, you know you're in a whole new world altogether. So what happens historically is the Fed pauses. And a tightening cycle always ends, just like an easing cycle always ends. And then with the pause, you get a relief rally. But then what happens is that the recessionary pressures take hold. Then what happens is the Fed cut rates, and we've seen this so many times in the past, and you get another relief rally. Uh, and then once again, the recession pressures take hold. Uh, when, when they pause, you want to be very wary about the relief rally. You can rent it, you can't own it. And even after the, after the first rate cut in a recessionary bear market, the market doesn't bottom after the first rate cut. You know when the market bottoms? The market bottoms after the last rate cut. After you get the last rate cut and the market sees the whites of the eyes of the recovery, that's the fundamental low. Yeah, you know, well, that, might be 12, that might be 12 months from now. So beware the pause will generate headline news. You folks report on the pause. Then they'll cut rates and then we'll have a pop in the market. And everybody will think that, you know, the bull market's uh, right in front of us. But no, 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 no. Uh, if you want to pay attention to the historical record, and we know that history rhymes, the time to go super long the markets to understand when the fundamental low is, is actually after the last rate cut when the Fed re-steepens the yield curve. Usually the two tens curve is plus 140 basis points, median and mean by the time the market bottoms. We are so long away from that right now, it's not even funny. Well, but David, to John's point earlier on the show when he was talking to Sebastian Page, he said, is being bullish fighting the Fed right now? Because exactly what you pointed to, Neil Kashkari coming out and saying he was disappointed to see that the market was rallying after uh, that Powell speech and that he uh, isn't terribly unhappy and maybe even happy to see that the market is selling off in response to the latest guidance. How much are we looking for a weakening in the, uh, it's heightening in the financial conditions in order to satisfy the Fed's desire in terms of transmitting their policy? Right, well, the, um, that's the question. Um, I, I, I'm paying attention to what the Fed is telling us. Uh, I think they're wrong. Uh, I think that Powell's already told us we are operating policy uh, without focusing on what's happening on the supply side of the economy. Uh, of course, after 16 months, the grand total of 16 months, which in the annals of economic history is still transitory, the Fed has given us valuable information we are operating policy uh, without actually focusing on what's happening in the supply side anymore. They're, they're not relying on the fact that these bottleneck pressures are going to continue to ease, although all the data are showing that they are easing. So they're focused on the demand side. So the question becomes, um, given where the Fed thinks, sees the, the supply curve going, right. how far do they have to contract demand? How far do financial conditions have to tighten to get to that holy grail? In their model, I would say, and I've tried to copy their model, it's uh, the lowest 3,100 on the S&P, okay? And high yield spreads are 700 basis points. 
David. That's the that's the matrix. That's the combination that we'd have to get to to make right. to, to make Kashkari more comfortable with where the market. Well, oh, oh you're, you're, there's a little bit of the Rosenberg humor there this morning, uh, David. <laughs> off of Jackson Hole in the codification of two percent is the goal. Is the idea that it's not one America? I've been talking all morning about a heterogeneous America, heterogeneous outcomes. It is a ch challenge for any central bank. What does the Fed do about two, three, and even four Americas? Blanche Flower is apoplectic over the oddities of the American labor market. Do they need to look at us as one America, or can they study two, three, or even four Americas? No, I'd say that monetary policy has to be a national policy. Uh, you can't carry out a policy based on uh, a couple of segments of the economy or a couple of socioeconomic segments. I know, look, this time last year, Jay Powell was sounding more like a social worker. You really have to take a, a national <laughs> approach. Uh, and I'd be the first to say, by the way, that, you know, with the unemployment rate where it is, the participation rate where it is, uh, that's obviously on the Fed's mind is the, the the tightness of the labor market. This is so bizarre, Tom, that we would have had a year. Whether you okay, the debate about GDI and GDP is a complete waste of time. Let's take both measures together and just come to a conclusion that the economy is flat. Whether you look at it from an income perspective in real terms or spending, it's basically a flat economy. And and here the consensus is three hundred thousand on non-farm payrolls on Friday. Does anybody stop to think? Why would a flat economy need to be adding any jobs at all? Uh, that's the oddity. Uh, unless you think, unless you think potential is negative, which to me is ridiculous. Um, so I think at some point, let me just say, at some point, and this is where the tightening policy by the Fed is kiboshed, is when you start to see the erosion hit the labor market. I think that's really what they're waiting for. Well, David, you just touched on it. I'll be a little bit more diplomatic. The chairman in the past has demonstrated how sensitive he is to the political mood in the moment. If unemployment starts climbing, do you expect to see the same chairman Powell again? Well, I don't know if we'll see the same chairman Powell again, but do I think that the Fed will respond to a loosening in the labor market? I think they're waiting for that. Uh, I think all of us have been waiting for at least the participation rate to start going up. Uh, I mean, nobody wants to see outright job loss, but the big surprise has been, and and maybe there's maybe there's something to this long COVID story in terms of how it's impairing the participation rate. Uh, nobody wants to see employment go down. You can actually see the unemployment rate actually go up if the participation rate uh, starts to go up. So that's going to be very critical. But do I think that if the unemployment rate goes up uh, three, four, five tenths from where it is today, that they're done. I think that's all it would take. In fact, usually when you get three or four tenths of an increase in, in the unemployment rate, the lagging indicator that it is, the recession has already started. David, um, so that, that's yeah. So I think that I think that would be enough to to push the Powell pivot back on the front burner. We appreciate your view as always, David Rosenberg there of Rosenberg Research. TK, you know who we miss. The late great Alan Kruger. We really need the late great Alan Kruger to look at this labour market, TK, right. and just work out what's really going on. And David touched on he some would, of it there. He would be heated on the negative real wage and the social efficacy of bringing up minimum wage to help more than the minimum wage cohort. Coming up as we guide you towards the opening bout, Jerome Schneider of PIMCO, Laurie Cavasina of RBC Capital Markets. We'll catch up with Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo as well. All of that going into the opening bout, live from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The U.S. says that a controlled shutdown of the Ukrainian nuclear power plant seized by the Russians would be the safest option. Artillery shells continue to land near the plant. Meanwhile, International Atomic Energy Agency monitors will assess the damage and account for nuclear material at the reactor. President Biden will deliver a primetime speech Thursday, slamming Republicans for what he sees as their threats to U.S. rights and freedoms. According to a White House official, the president will speak about the continued, quote, battle for the soul of the nation. He's trying to boost Democrats' chances in the November elections. 
Best Buy posted quarterly profit that beat Wall Street estimates a month ago. The consumer electronics chain warned that it was under pressure from slumping demand. Consumers are shifting more spending to travel and other services. That's after they binged on TVs, computers and appliances during the first two years of the pandemic. And Goldman Sachs warns that the downturn in the U.S. housing market has further to go. In a research note, Goldman says it expects home price growth to average 0% next year due to higher mortgage rates and reduced affordability. But the firm says that large price declines are unlikely. And in California, the state Senate has approved a bill that offers fast food workers a role in regulating the industry. It establishes a process for pay and workplace standards to be set by a council comprised of employees and franchise owners, amongst others. The state assembly still has to give final approval. It's unclear if Governor Gavin Newsom will sign the bill into law. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think the lead theme is that we end up retesting the June 16th low, but right now our belief is that we do not set a lower low. So right now, uh, increased volatility, it will be a September to remember, uh, but I think we will get through this okay. Sam Stovall, cut from a different cloth, the chief investment strategist at CFRA Research, and there, easily 100 years of Stovall strategic interest with his legendary father who invented the business and, of course, moving it forward there with the star ratings at CFRA. We're going to do that right now. We're going to have a difficult conversation with Barry Ritholtz. His podcast is huge. Masters in Business is smart, smart, smart. He also happens to run some money every once in a while. Barry, you hit a third rail with me this week, and we're going to get an update here because what's new now in the fee game and what Peter Lynch called diversification mm -hmm. is people buying index funds like they're kelpers. You're taking modest small wealth, you're running it like kelpers, and you're overlaying it with really fees from years in my youth. We're not talking 20 beeps. We're talking some big fees to run index funds. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I, I, this past weekend on Masters in Business, I had – a uh, Bloomberg Intelligence um, analyst, Eric Balchun, is talking about yeah, the wonderful. Vanguard effect and how over the past 40 years, Vanguard has driven down the cost, not <clears> just <throat> for their customers, but for everybody who had to compete. And so every now and then, you'll find this anomaly of high-priced index funds, high-priced, very basic investment strategies. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's perplexing that in 2022 this sort of stuff still exists it should be fairly reasonably easy to get affordable financial advice okay. that that isn't overly complex and layered with expensive fees but two, the, three, ar four but percent. the arch matter here and now it's more acute because we've had a horrific bond historic bear market and the equity market, maybe not so much sport as well, is you and I and others, Arthur Levitt, who basically blew up the individual stock game, the bottom line is we thought things have changed. And still, people are managing for a stick and a quarter for two points. Dare I say, someone's getting screwed right now for two and a half points on an uh, index it, fund that you and I didn't even... It used to be you worked at this. Now you just buy Vanguard ETF. Uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of shocking that, you know, this level of um, – look, it, it's one thing if you're going to say to somebody, I have this unique strategy and that's why yeah. I'm in a 2 and 20 <clears throat> and, you know, we may not shoot the lights out every year, but that's what we're going yeah. for. And if you want to take a little – portion of your wealth and throw it into that sort of highlight game, uh, go ahead. Yeah. But the core of your portfolio, you know, I don't understand why people are paying 2%, two percent, right, wow. For, wow. for just, you know, very straight up asset management. Yeah. Uh, now, if you're adding financial planning, estate planning, tax management, et cetera, right. uh, okay, then you, you, some of that is built <clears throat> into the yeah. fees. But it's always shocking to find these uh, you know, modest size accounts that, that are paying close to 2% yeah. Yeah. for what essentially you go to a robo-advisor and pay 50 basis points or less. Lisa, jump in, please. 
Well, I just am wondering if this is just another note of froth that's going to get beaten out of the market as it becomes more difficult to get returns, right? I mean, is this basically a byproduct of a couple of years where the Fed came to the market's rescue at all uh, at every turn, and you could afford to lose a 2% haircut off of whatever your profits were based on your returns, and people weren't paying attention as much? You know... In the past, a lot of people used to say nobody really cared about fees in the 90s when the markets were going up. But if you look at the 2010s, that's the era. That that decade was when Vanguard went from a trillion to eight trillion. BlackRock went from two trillion to nine trillion. So even in this very robust, I don't know, 13, 15 percent a year over that decade for the S&P 500, even in a very robust um a market with a strong bull bias, people still had become very price uh, sensitive. Perhaps that's part of the reason those indexes did so well. All that money flowed to Vanguard and BlackRock and that, you know, half of those assets went to indexes. Barry, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Really smart note there in the fee game, which we don't talk enough about here. Futures up 18. They deteriorate a little bit. The VIX 25.60 showing a bit uh, a, a better tape. Lisa, what's the ramification if credit gives way, price down, yield up? Well, that's what people are trying to figure out. And which aspects of credit? You're already seeing that in a pretty dramatic fashion yes. in the riskier sections of high yield. Uh, with the lowest tier, the triple C's, now yielding an average of more than 10%, which is considered distressed, right? So you're already seeing that. So where is the canary in the coal mine? And there was actually a recent report from Morgan Stanley saying that leveraged loans uh, may end up being just that. But until now, and this is a really important well, point, Tom, until now, credit's held in. And people have used this as justification <clears throat> for the stock rally or for the yeah. stock resilience. At yeah. what point does the credit still serve as some sort of canary for other risk assets? I found my chart for tomorrow, Lisa. It's real simple. I just looked up the aggregate, the total summed bond chart for the Bloomberg, the Lehman, the old Barclays index. And we are right, Lisa, at the cusp where it breaks down to new, lower price, higher yield. I think this is underreported the end of August. Well, yes. We've been talking about how the Bloomberg aggregate index has declined by nearly 20 percent since the peak over in January of 2021. So we've seen a massive uh, bear market, unlike we've seen anything the likes of which we've seen over the past generation. So at what point, I know that this is your third rail, Tom, which is people don't talk about how much pain has been suffered. At the same time, people have been talking about the opportunity because when yield goes way up, people see the yield. They're not yeah. looking at the price, especially if they didn't, weren't invested in those particular securities before. So at what point does it become attractive again? And that's what we're starting to hear from people. The other thing that slipped through the radar today, uh, Lisa, is that Hungarian central Central bank rate at 12 percent. How do you run a 12 percent interest rate economy, 11 point X percent, I should say. How do you run an 11 point X percent economy given all the shocks of Europe, including the war? I don't, I don't, just don't get you know, it. This is the conundrum, and this is what we've been talking about for weeks. How do you hike rates into weakness? How do you hike rates into instability? Yeah. And that is what central banks around the world are doing. And what's so important here, and you can do this, folks, with Ritholtz management, you can look at Euro foreign is a part of a diversifier to your portfolio. Hungarian foreign, weaker here since April against here. Where are you going to get information like that? I mean, nowhere else. Futures up 17. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to another special U.S. Open update for Bloomberg TV and radio from Tennis Channel. I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. Serena Williams was the only ticket in town on day one at Flushing Meadows. Serena Williams. A pass say goodbye just yet. Oh my God! Rafael Nadal headlines Tuesday's action in the Big Apple as he looks to extend his lead in the all-time list at the Slams. The Spaniard can claim his 23rd major crown in New York. And don't forget, Tennis Channel Live at the US Open hits the air daily at 9 a.m. Eastern with everything you need to know from the Big Apple.